Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, we have now come back out of uh, confidential after uh, some deliberation here on committee, uh, and as a result uh, of uh, that deliberation, um, item number six will be removed from the schedule to book today for the agenda today, uh, and we will not now be hearing uh, that item, and the applicant will be uh, contacted in due course by uh, planning officers uh, in relation to that matter. Um, so. Uh, that is that. Maura, have you any further information you want to impart? Okay. So, um, thank you, Maura. Thank you, members. So, just uh, in relation to that particular decision, now we can reference the running order for everyone today. And the running order will be items one, two, three, four, five, eight, nine, and seven in that particular order. Okay, members, moving on to matters arising from the open minutes of the planning committee and meeting held on Wednesday, the 18th of March, 2022. Any matters arising? Again, matters arising from the open minutes of the reconvened planning committee uh, on Thursday, the 19th of April, uh, 2022. Any matters arising in relation to that? Okay, thank you, members. Okay, members, we will now move on to the main business of the meeting uh, and the first application that we will be hearing is uh, G2014-0295-F uh, uh, and Andre is going to present this particular report. Um, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, so item one is application G2014-0295-F. Um, the, the application is for proposed quarry restoration by way of infilling with inert and excavated waste material, waybridge, wheel wash, site office, site works and new access, and it's located at lands adjacent to and 120 metres northwest of an existing concrete works at Strahan's Road in Stravan, and the recommendation is to approve. So, members, the site lies outside the defined development limits of Stravan Town and is therefore located in the countryside. The application site consists of an existing hard rock quarry void, which over time has filled with standing water. The site is located in the open countryside to the west of the defined settlement limits of Straban, and the wider area is characterised by open agricultural fields. Dairy City and Straban's District Council's recycling facility is located adjacent to the site to the east, and an existing concrete works is located to the south. So, as stated, the application site comprises a former work quarry, which is now filled with water. The documents submitted in support of the application advise that the quarry ceased operation a number of years ago, at which time dewatering also ceased and the groundwater was allowed to return to it, its at-rest condition, which is approximately 14 metres above the floor of the working of the quarry, and is reported to have been flooded by flow and fractures of the rock. The quarry is understood to be approximately 27 metres deep at, the, at its deepest point towards the north. So the following slide members, um, this shows photographs of the existing site and these were submitted by the agent. So this slide shows the northern and eastern side of the quarry void. This is the northern side. This is the eastern side, and you'll see the council's recycling facility there in the background. And this is the western quarry face. So members, the details of the proposal. So the application is for the proposed restoration um, of the existing hard rock quarry by way of infilling with inert and excavated waste material. The proposal also includes the installation of a waybridge, a wheel wash, a site office, and the construction of a new access on the Strahan's Road, along with um, all the associated site works. So Strahan's Road passes to the north of the existing quarry, um, with the area between the road and the quarry to be developed as a site entrance area with associated infrastructure, as detailed above. The new road access and visible displays is set back from the current alignment of Strahan's Road, as there are preliminary proposals from GFI Roads for the realignment of Strands Road 
as part of the A5 Western Transport Corridor. So the site access therefore allows for the current scenario and the future realignment as per DFI roads requirements. So it is proposed to dewater the existing quarry void prior to the initial filling operations to allow the deposition of material to occur in dry conditions. This will be done by pumping water via pipe to an existing local water course known as Flush Town Drain. The ongoing dewatering of the quarry will be required to be maintained as the infilling of the quarry is underway until the restoration reaches the lowest quarry rim, when at that point dewatering will no longer be required, as at this stage all filling will be at least five metres above the at-rest groundwater level. So the agent advises that all waste vehicles entering the site will cross a weigh bridge to record the weight of the vehicles. Um, initially, vehicles arriving at the site will deposit loads adjacent to where the access road meets the edge of the quarry. And from here, it will be transferred by excavator to the quarry area for management by a dozer or excavator within the quarry void. So as tipping progresses, an access road suitable for travel by articulated dump truck will be provided. After these initial periods of infilling, an access road will be provided from the entrance area to the tipping face to allow all vehicles access to the site to be able to drive safely to and from the tipping area. So the agent states that the objective of the operation of the site is to provide for restoration of the quarry to as close as reasonable to its original pre-development condition. This will be achieved with filling um, with inert material, um, mainly inert waste derived from a variety of sources, including the construction and demolition industries. So inert landfill is described as a disposal facility accepting only wastes that will not or not likely to cause production of leachate of environmental concern, and such wastes, wastes are limited to earth and earth-like products, concrete, cured asphalt, rocks, bricks, yard trimming, stumps, limbs and leaves. The agent has advised that waste to be accepted at the site will comprise of the following European waste catalogue codes, and these include waste, glass-based, fibrous materials, glass packaging, concrete, bricks, tiles and ceramics, glass, soil and stones, glass and soil and stones are just different waste codes there associated with each of those. Um, all of the above wastes are inert wastes and the condition, um, as you'll see from the report, um, can be placed on any grant of approval to ensure that no unacceptable waste codes are accepted at the site. So as detailed in the report also, the restoration comprises the dep deposition of waste material and this falls within the requirements of the landfill regulations, NI, and the Pollution Prevention and Control Industrial Emissions Regulations. And as such, um, it would require a PPC permit to operate. So this permit is issued by the Department of the Environment and Rural Affairs um, and NIEA Waste Regulation Unit. So in order to obtain the permit, an application will be made by the applicant, which will set out the details of the proposed operation of the site and will include various reports to establish potential risk to the water environment and stability risk assessments to ensure that the proposed infilling is stable. Mm -hmm. If the permit is granter, granted, the operator is required to undertake regular site inspections and monitoring. Um, and on a quarterly basis, waste returns are prepared and sent to NIEA. And as part of the permit application and the subsequent site operation, um, management plans are produced, um, which set out how the site will operate. And when the site is um, fully restored, the operator applies to surrender the permit. Um, and this, again, has to be uh, supplemented by a number of reports that will be inspected by NIEA. Um, and inspection will also be carried out by personnel. Um, but this um, is a separate regulatory, regulatory function outside of the planning process. So during the processing of the planning application, the following documents and supporting information has been submitted by the agent. So site access report, including traffic speed survey, transport assessment, supporting planning statement, clarification in relation to the A5, an impact of quarry filling activities, drainage assessment, noise and dust assessment, preliminary risk assessment, hydrological assessment, and rocks face stability assessment, a noise report, method statement, a construction method statement and an updated method statement also. Um, so as mentioned previously, members, the proposed development is within the land take associated with the preferred route of the A5 Western Transport Corridor, and this runs to the west of the application site. 
The quarry site is located within the draft vesting line of the new road. And during the processing of the application, the AFI roads and the A5 WDC strategic road um, team were consulted regarding the proposed development. So the agent has submitted a number of documents, including a method statement, which has been revised and updated during the processing in order to demonstrate that the proposed development would not have any potential detrimental impact on the proposed A5 road scheme. Um, so the submitted method statement includes a lot of information and that's just listed there um, for members. Um, and this slide, members, just shows the proximity of the major road proposals. That's for the, the new A5. Um, and the green shaded area is the quarry void as existing. So during the processing of the application, um, the following consultees um, were consulted. So um, DFI Roads, um, they have reviewed the, the method statement and have also um, Assess the proposed access um, of Strahan's Road, and they have confirmed in November 21 that they have no objection to the proposed development subject to conditions. Um, NIEA Water Management Unit, Natural Heritage Unit, Waste, Water Manage Waste Management Unit, and Historic Monuments Unit all have no objections. DFI Rivers Environmental Health Department, Shared Environmental Services. Um, were also consult consulted in the application and have no objections. Um, and during the processing of the application, no representations have been received. So in summary, members, no objections have been received during the processing of the application. Um, and as is detailed in the, the planning report, it is considered that the proposal complies with the Straban area plan and all relevant planning policies, including the SPPS, PPS 2, 3, 6, 11, 15, and 21. Um, all consultees have no objection to the proposed restoration subject to conditions and informatives, and it is therefore recommended that the application is approved. Thank you, members. Thank you, Andre. Okay, members, open it up to the floor. And for those online, if you'd like to indicate in the chat box, um, obviously we have a recommendation to approve uh, this application. Um, so any questions for the officer? Yes, uh, Councillor McGuire. Thank you, Chair, and uh, wish you well in your year. Um, back to page 21. If the permit is granted, the operator is required to undertake regular site inspections and monitoring, usually on a monthly, quarterly and annual basis. Apologies, Councillor McGuire. I'm a wee bit ring rusty, so we're going to have to come back to you on that. I, I should have afforded Speaker, the opportunity. Sorry. I should have afforded the opportunity to uh, the applicant uh, to speak. Uh, and that's Gavin McGill and John Dundee. So apologies to you, Councillor McGuire. That's, uh, that's uh, just a <laughs> sure, sure saying that I haven't sat up in this chair for a wee while. Apologies to the applicant um, as well. If you'd like to address the committee now, um, Gavin and John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. Um, I just want to thank Andre for her detailed uh, presentation. And we'd just like to say that we fully concur with the Council's recommendation to approve the application. And we don't have anything to present, but we are more than happy to answer any questions that councillors may have. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm working on the assumption, uh, Councillor McGuire, that your question was for the officer. Um, so, members, um, uh, in the first instance, uh, any questions for the applicants here? Uh, Councillor Barr, or, uh, Raymond Barr, are you seeking a question of the applicant? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Uh, no, no questions. I just wanted to really comment on it. You know, um, from a safety and public health point of view, uh, I, for one, would well, be glad to see this application uh, granted. For a number of years now, young people have been using the quarry for bathing and warm weather. And unfortunately, a few years back, one young man lost his life uh, here. You know, so that, to me, this could, uh, this could only be a positive if this application was granted. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, Councillor Barr. Um, well, I didn't hear a question, so I'll move on. Um, uh, Councillor Jason Barr. Uh, again, a question for the applicant. No question, uh, Chair. I was just going to make a proposal. Just if you don't mind, Councillor Barr, uh, 
I'm, I'm looking for questions of, of the applicant. Does anyone have questions of the applicant? Chair, yes, I, have a, I have a question. Sorry, who's that now? It's Dan. Dan, sorry, Dan, you're not on the chat box. Go ahead, Dan. I don't have access to a chair. Come here. Um, I have, I've, uh, I'm asking for a little bit of leeway just in terms of my first question because it's not strictly speaking uh, a planning matter. Um, but um, uh, this, everyone will be aware uh, of the, the sensitivities with this site. And, and obviously, Councillor Barr has already referenced, you know, the fact that, that there's been tragic circumstances associated with the site. And I appreciate the neighbour notification process is limited to the 90 metres uh, of any application within the planning system. But I'm just wondering um, if the agent would be indicate, um, and, and I would take some comfort from the fact if they have had any conversations with um, the family members of those who either drowned or were, who were found dead on the site uh, over the last number of, of decades, um, before we get into a sort of a debate and a discussion around, uh, or an, an ultimately a determination of the application. The site is, is very sensitive to those people who were bereaved. Uh, and I, I just wonder, was there any sort of discussion with them? And are they aware that this has taken place? Because I know some of them do travel to that site on an annual basis, obviously for obvious reasons, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've been bereaved. So that's that's one question, Chair. The other question is in relation to, I didn't see it in the report, and this may be a matter for um, officers as well. And it's in relation to um, the concerns that have been raised in relation to uh, dumped and, and abandoned vehicles that may be on the quarry floor uh, that were driven off the cliff <laughs> or, or, you know, sent over the cliff. Um, and I, I, I appreciate um, that's coming to me as hearsay because I didn't see any vehicles. I don't know if there's vehicles there or not, but I don't see it in the hydrogeological uh, survey. And I, I just wonder, uh, have that has that been considered? Have they surveyed that? And uh, if you could give me some information on that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. So that one question to the applicant, and then we'll hold the other question, if you don't mind, for the officer uh, in relation to the uh, vehicles that may well uh, or may not be. We don't know. Um, uh, so um, if, if the applicant would like to answer the, the first question posed by Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Um, I'm not aware of any approach uh, that's been made to the, the family of the bereaved, but um, we'd certainly be willing to facilitate that uh, uh, prior to, to any work commencing on site if you were to um, vote to approve the application today. Yep, thank you. Um, no other questions? If there are no other questions, then I'll, I'll do Councillor Jason Barr the courtesy of uh, allowing him to come in. I think you had a comment that you wanted to make. Uh, Jason, go ahead. I uh, was uh, under it's just a proposal, Chair, but uh, I'd be happy for the officer to answer Dan Kelly's question first. Okay. Are there any other questions for the applicant, uh, Councillor McGuire? I was just about to get to there, Councillor <laughs> McGuire. All right. Uh, any other questions for the applicant before we move on over to uh, officer questions? Okay. Um, okay, Councillor McGuire, uh, to the officer. Uh, Chair, it, it's, it's going back to the uh, page 21 and uh, just it's uh, the second paragraph. Uh, if the permit is granted, the operator is required to undertake regular site inspections and monitoring, usually on a monthly or quarterly and annual basis. Uh, that would not sit well with me, Chair. Um, you know, when the officer, when the, when, when the, the owner if he wasn't making regular site inspections, just supposing, you know, someone dumped a load of asbestos or whatever, and next thing it's it's in the, you know, it's in the bottom of the pile, and it's you know it's seeping around. You no, know, there's local residents, there's hundreds of people employed nearby. I was just wondering, is that the best, you know, monitoring monthly and quarterly basis? Is is that the best we could do? Is there a condition that we could put in there that um, would ensure the safety of the residents around the area. Yes, thank you through the chair. Um, just to clarify, the, I suppose that the planning permission is one element of um, what would be required 
for the operation of the site. The PCC permit is outside of the planning process, um, and that is something that is operated by DERA um, and NIEA. So it's a license that the applicant has to obtain. If they are granted approval um, and the permission is issued, then that's a completely separate process. And that regime of monitoring by NIEA, um, we would have no influence over that. That is just part of their license agreement through the permit that they have to apply for, that that monitoring is undertaken. Um, and it was just to assure members that there is that other process outside of, of the grant of planning approval um, that the, the applicant would have to demonstrate that he's complying with only accepting the inert waste at the site. Do you know, he has approval for certain waste codes um, and there shouldn't be anything else accepted at the site. And there's a monitoring regime and a license regime outside of planning to deal with that. Um, with regards to planning, monitoring, the site at any other, I don't think that would be something that we could condition that we would do on a, a regular basis. It's not something we would normally do and we would allow the permits that are in place um, or applied for and grant if they are granted, um, that that would, um, I suppose, enforce and control what is done at the site. We have other conditions on there that we, we would usually put on with regards to the noise and operation times and things like that. Um, if there's another condition that members feel needs to be put on the application that is planning reason or planning condition, then certainly we'll, we'll consider that or members can suggest that. Yeah, you see, uh, you know, we're approving uh, the inert waste, you know, and which is right, and it, I'm glad to see that you know this quarry has been restored uh, because of what has been spoke about earlier. You know, there has been a loss of life on on due to it, but we're approving an earth waste, but it's only been monitored possibly on a monthly, quarterly, or annual basis, and I just feel it's it's. Week, you know, and maybe Philip could advise is there any other way, or should we write to DERA, or you know, what do we do to ensure that it's least right? Okay, Carson McGuire, um, you know, I mean, I think I'd like to the answer that came from. Andre, I don't disagree with you, by the way. I, 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 don't, I, I do agree with you. Uh, but it seems that there is no other way that it can be done unless through the licenses. No, so, but you know, I'm, I'm just going just gonna to see, see if Philip has anything that he, that he can answer. Uh, um, Kieran, if you don't mind. Yeah, sorry. Um, appreciate um, just discussing with, with Eamon there, but NIEA are the competent authority. Uh, in relation to the, the kind of monitoring that you're talking about. Um, it, it's not an area uh, in respect of which we would have that level of competence at the present time. Okay, so it's just uh, Go ahead, Karen. Just yep. a comment. It's just, you know, the cost of, of say, dumping uh, uh, asbestos now is a great, of great cost to the person that has to do it. And, you know, if they got flight happening there, you know, between the monthly inspection, you know, or a quarterly inspection, you know, it's, it's a great relief, but it's, uh, it's a great, it, it could be a serious issue to the people around it. And uh, I think we should possibly let NIE know, know our concerns. Uh, I know we probably can't condition that, but possibly write to them, suppose this committee would write to them and let us know their concern or concerns. Okay, Councillor McGuire, um, I don't see any harm in us writing to them, absolutely not. Um, Andre. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to clarify, you know, other than just the inspections by NIEA, the, the permit and the licensing regime that the operators have to go through, they have to keep um, strict management controls on the site. Um, it's not, you know, the site will be secure. It's not to say that, you know, I can't say that for definite there'll be no flight happen at the entrance to the site or anything, but the site will be secure. 
um, and there's daily logs of, of all waistcoats. You know, it is very um, regimented. Um, I don't deal with PCC permits, but there is probably a lot of paperwork that the operator will have to keep and show. So it's not just that somebody will arrive on a monthly basis and that's the only check that will happen through the licensing. Um, it is more rigorous than just a, a monthly or, or quarterly or annual check by an inspector. Um, you know, some of that is detailed on page 21. Um, you know, the, the site diary is maintained, which includes a summary of daily activities, occurrences, monitoring, waste inputs, and any quarantine material. And then NIEA officers will also visit the site and carry out inspections on a regular basis to ensure that it is operated in accordance with the permit. So again, that is all outside the planning process, but it's just to assure members that it's not just a, a monthly visit um, by an officer. Okay, Andre. Um, of course, Andre, I would have a suspect as well. There's nothing to stop the NIEA from turning up on spec uh, uh, as well. Um, you know, that's that's part and parcel of how they do it uh, as well. Uh, I've, 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 uh, I've cared if you feel that it's appropriate to, to, to write the NAEA, then, then I, I have no uh, problem with doing that. Yeah, without holding up, you know, the, the application or nothing, but I just do think, uh, I'm sure you, you get my concerns, you know, uh, you know, if someone puts a load of uh, asbestos on the bottom of a tupper lorry and covers it with a bit of gravel, you know, like uh, just, you know, they're saving a lot of money. So uh, just for this concern for the residents and the, indeed the employees and, and around the area, just chair, I think we should let them know. I, I propose that again. Okay. Well, well uh, I'm, uh, I'm content to write on behalf of the committee to express those particular concerns and, uh, and obviously the we would want to see that there was a, a robust regime in and around the monitoring of the particular site. Councillor McKinney, you did indicate there. Thank you, Chair. Just really, they totally uh, agree with what uh, uh, Councillor McGuire has said. I mean, I have sort of worked in the waste industry now and again, and on uh, the likes of uh, uh, not temporaries, but on the what do you call the. Um, we parking we said our highest rubble, I think skips sorry. And I have seen some of the some of the things that people do and I totally express my concerns about it, especially asbestos, because once asbestos gets in the air, it's deadly. Thank you. Okay. Um thank you. Um I, I see in the chat box there that the, the applicant wants to come back and unfortunately uh, the protocol of the planning committee doesn't afford me the opportunity to allow you to come back in again. Um uh, but I think uh, it's it's evident from from the conversation here that there there are always going to be concerns uh, around uh, what sort of waste um, is going to be uh, ultimately end up uh, in the site. But as Andre said, um, uh, members, the site all likelihood have a fence around it and will be well monitored by the applicant as well. To be fair, uh, so unless there are any further questions, Councillor Jackson. Members, I'm very keen to move on. So can we keep the questions in relation to this in terms of planning and planning policies? Uh, Chair, no, I'm just conscious that there was an outstanding question from Councillor Kelly around the survey of the site. Through the Chair, thank you. Um, Councillor Kelly raised the issue of um, if we were aware that there was dumped vehicles in the quarry floor. I am not aware through any of the reports that were submitted. Um, but whenever the dewatering starts and if anything is there in the, the quarry floor, I'm sure it will be removed as per the appropriate measures. Okay, that's the answer to your question there. Um, Councillor Kelly, I, I do see now in the chat box that you'd like to come back in on that, so go ahead. Chair, uh, I, I do have a number of other questions for the officer, if you would be happy enough to take them. I'll indulge uh, them. Go ahead, Councillor Kelly. Thanks, Chair. It's, I suppose the first one is on page, it relates to page 20. I'm just wondering how long has the quarry, uh, has extraction stopped at the quarry? Um, uh, you're probably wondering why, but uh, uh, the, the reason I want to know is there is a significant number of disused and abandoned quarries across our district. And I'm just wondering um, to what extent um, historic sites can be, suppose, be revived 
uh, through landfill because I know there's a, quite a number of people who will be looking at this wondering is the site next door to them uh, going to start coming into use so uh, that's that's just the first question the second question chair is um, also on page 20 it states that materials will be deposited at the surface after they arrive for inspection after they've passed their inspection so there's going to be a spoil heap effectively um, uh, on, on the surface and I'm just wondering um, on page 22 it lists the waste codes and I'm wondering so could somebody clarify waste code 101103 uh, which is described as glass fibre waste and I'm just um, picking up on Councillor Maguire's point um, around asbestos I, I'm just wondering what, what does glass fibre waste consist of and, and I didn't see anything in the environmental health um, consultation response in relation to depositing glass fibre waste on the surface and whether, for example, on a windy day, that could actually, that waste might enter the, the, the airstream and affect people in the vicinity. So I'm just, some clarification on that as well would be good. Um, on page 24, um, uh, the council has determined that um, this application didn't require an environmental statement and given the very intimate links uh, of the application link uh, of the application site to the hydrological system, um, I'm just wondering how did the council make that conclusion? And this one chair is in relation to um, flood lighting, uh, and again it links back to what Councillor Maguire has raised. You know, given the proposed operation times from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., uh, and given that materials are accepted on site. Um, based on a visual a visual inspection, uh, what what's the flood lighting proposal? Because I didn't see that in there either, um, particularly for materials that would be received, for example, at seven a.m. during the winter months when it would be very dark. Um, at eight, eight o'clock, they could be at the bottom of the quarry, and it's still very dark. So I'm just wondering, what is the the, the flood lighting uh, in and around that site? And and I didn't see anything on that in the environmental health response either. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Kelly. So a number of questions there. If you'd want to just take them, take us through them. Yes, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Councillor Kelly, for your questions. Um, I'll try. I've jotted down a couple, so forgive me, and I can come back to ones just if I've missed um, responding to any. Um, I don't know how long the quarry has not been in use for. Um, I do believe that it was. Um, started to be quarried between the 1940s and 1960s, but I'm unsure as to how long um, it has been left um, as abandoned or filled with water, um, but it wouldn't have had um, the benefit of a previous approval where there was restoration um, conditioned to be part of the quarrying activities, which is, is the norm now for a quarry application. Um, so with regards to what other abandoned quarries are in our district or essentially in the north of Ireland, um, which could potentially be used as landfill. Again, sorry, I don't have um, a detail as to how many. Um, there is a potential ROMP scheme, which is not enacted as yet, um, and that might allow for some further monitoring of any disused um, quarries that um, don't have restoration proposals as part of um, any plan on approval. Um, glass fibre waste. Um, I've just got some information. It's non-hazardous waste. Again, it's inert. Um, and it would be wastes from manufacture of glass and glass products. Um, there was no issue raised with regard, you're right, with environmental health as to um, that being on site or, or stockpiled on site. Um, I suppose from the details of the reports in the application, um, where um, prior to the unfilling taking place, until the, the site is dewatered, so first of all, the site is dewatered, um, and then until they can get vehicles onto the quarry floor to be able to move the, I suppose, the, the waste around the quarry floor to start filling it properly. Um, they will be temporarily left at the side of the quarry at surface level. I don't envisage that that would be for any length of time. 
um, and again, that will be strictly managed through um, the licensing regime that the, the applicant will have to go through as well. Um, so I would hope that there, through the licensing regime there, that there would be no um, potential for any waste, any inert waste that is going to be um, at the site to be allowed to enter the wider environment. Um, I just know that asbestos is a hazardous waste and not inert. So again, through the permit and the licensing regime, there should be no hazardous wastes accepted, um, and that will all be have to manage be managed by the the applicant and the operator. Um, th there was an EIA determination carried out on the application um, through consultee responses, um, including NED and SES. Um, we considered that there was no um, significant environmental risk from the proposed dewatering um, and filling with an earth waste um, for the site, and therefore a null determination was carried out. And the details of that report um, will be on the planning portal. Um, with regards to floodlighting, there's no details of the floodlighting um, on the application, but if members wish, we can attach um, a planning condition to say prior to commencement, if members are minded to approve, the prior to commencement of um, any operation commencing at the site, the details of any floodlights um, shall be submitted to be agreed in writing between the, the plan department and EHD. Um, I think that's all the questions. Thank you, Andre. Um, okay, Councillor Kelly, there's some of the answers for you. Um, uh, are you content to move on? Thanks, Chair. I am content yeah, with that. And um, uh, when you come to uh, accepting a proposal, um, if uh, I, I might be able to come back in because I will be looking to maybe amend it, depending on what proposal comes forward, I might be looking to amend some of the conditions or attach a condition as outlined by um, uh, the officer there. Thanks. Yeah, OK, uh, Councillor Kelly, I'll certainly come back to you before uh, we uh, progress it through. Um, are there any other questions before I move on with that next element of the process? Uh, just, just yes, Councillor Gallagher, go ahead, Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Chair. Just I and I'm, I'm aware of the geography and there's another fairly large quarry filled with water and it's probably no more than five, six hundred yards high to the northwest of this quarry. Would the anthem have any bearing on, on that one? I wonder. Just a quick answer to that. No, Mr. Gallagher. That's uh, quick enough. Separate, separate <laughs> site. Thanks. Short and sweet. Thanks for the question. I'm short and sweet enough answer. Um, uh, before I do um, put the proposal, uh, I'm conscious that um, Councillor Jason Barr done indicate earlier that he, he wanted to come in on this. So again, uh, Jason, uh, I'm, I'll afford you that opportunity now if you still want it. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's just to make a proposal, that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. There's nobody else indicating, so go ahead there, yep. Councillor Barr. Yep. I've been off from everything to said there, Chair, and I especially agree with Councillor Kelly's point on the the applicants uh, approaching the family members of those who passed away at that site, uh, just out of respect. So, yeah, totally agree with that. So, Chair, with that being said, more than happy to propose that we accept the officer recommendation to approve this application. Thank you, uh, Councillor Barr. Uh, do we have a seconder? Obviously, the, the proposal is to accept the officer recommendation in front of us here. Seconder for that proposal. Happy to accept, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, okay. Members. Okay, before we go to a vote, uh, I'm going to bring Councillor Kelly back, and he did indicate that he wanted to address some of the conditions there. So uh, back to yourself there, Councillor mm -hmm. Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm looking to amend uh, condition number 13 first. Um, uh, not the condition, but just the reason. Um, and it's around the, the sole vehicle uh, vehicular access to the site. 
and that would be in the interests of uh, road safety, but also in the interests of uh, monitor monitoring waste uh, coming on uh, to the site. Um, condition 18, um, the Saturday operational hours are listed as 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, I think that's too broad, uh, and I'm not sure what uh, the committee feel about that, uh, particularly for people in the vicinity for the, their weekend. So um, I'm, uh, I'm not proposing a time, but I, I certainly think that's that's too broad for the Saturday. Uh, I don't see any condition on storage of oils and fuels on site uh, and runoff from the wheel wash getting into the uh, the water table. So I'm, I'm 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 raising that as a new condition effectively. Maybe uh, if if um, if that could be worded appropriately and included. Uh, also, the previous one in relation to as Andre outlined could be added in relation to flood lighting. And um, if I'm, I'm not sure about the wording. I don't have a proposed wording, but in terms of condition 19 and contamination, if uh, during the dewatering process, um, you know, there are vehicles found on the quarry floor, uh, I think that should be incorporated uh, within that condition and, and specify uh, a, a program of work overseen by the department. Um, so I don't have a wording for that, but I would be proposing that that condition or an additional condition um, uh, incorporate that fact. That's me, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan. And uh, officers are indicating that they can f certainly find the appropriate wording to um, uh, to follow up uh, for for you in relation to those conditions. Councillor Kelly, I, I, I'm conscious you did indicate the the Saturday opening times were perhaps a little bit too broad. If you feel it appropriate, uh, I I'd be interested in hearing what what time frame you think uh, would be uh, the right one. I don't know the neighbourhood, so uh, uh, do you have anything in mind in relation to that, Dan? Uh, Chair, I, th I think 8am is, is early enough. Okay, so you're suggesting that we would amend the Saturday to an 8am start. I'll put that as well, members, for your consideration. So th those are the various Amendments to the conditions from Councillor Kelly. Is everybody uh, content with those particular amendments? Okay. Members, we do have a proposal on the floor. Councillor Jason Barr, a seconder. Oh, Councillor Gallagher, thank you. It's just sometimes when people aren't in front of you, you can't remember. <laughs> um, so thank you to Councillor Barr and Councillor Gallagher. Proposal in front of us, member, accept the recommendation, bearing in mind the amendments uh, to the conditions. Are all in favour? No indicated. Yep, it appears everybody's in favour of that, so that's a, a unanimous decision. Thank you, members. Thank you, officers. Thank you, Andre. Okay, members, uh, uh, and again, thank you to Gavin uh, and John for uh, joining us as well this afternoon. Uh, hopefully, you'll be content with that decision. Um, uh, application uh, LA 11 2021 RM. Uh, again, uh, offer approval. Uh, officer presenting is Sarah. Yeah, item two is LA 11 2021 0109 RM. This is a proposed major mixed-use development comprising of 740 dwellings consisting of a mix of social, affordable and private housing, part delivery of High Street to include a retail store, cafe restaurant, retail units, office units, live work units, gym, community centre, provision of new road network to connect to the realign Koshkun and White House Road, new pedestrian and cycleways, public squares, open spaces, children's play areas, hard and soft landscaping, and all other site and access works. And the site is on lands accessed from Skag Roundabout to the west of Moncrana Road, north of River Glen and southwest of numbers 30, 32, and 34 Koshkun Road. And the site is identified as the H2 zone in the dairy area plan 2011. Officer's recommendation is to approve. So this is the site location plan and aerial photograph of the site. 
The site is located on the H2 zoned housing lands as defined in the Dairy Area Plan 2011, accessed off the A2 Bunkrana Road at Skag Roundabout. Outline permission was granted on the H2 zoned lands under A2006-0441 in November 2018, along with the Section 76 legal agreement. This application is the first reserve matters application on the zoned lands following the grant of outline permission. The current reserve matters application was accompanied along with an environmental statement. So this slide just to is to show you the approved concept plan and the updated concept, which includes the reserve matters application. This is the overall layout and open space areas. And this proposal will include a mix of social, affordable and private housing. There will be 420 social housing units, 70 private units and 250 affordable dwelling units. Dwellings do comprise of a mix of townhouses, apartments, semi-detached and detached dwellings. The proposal also includes the part delivery of a high street to include a mix of convenience retail store, a cafe restaurant, retail units, office units, live work units, a gym and a community centre. The application includes revision of strategic open space in the form of a town park, an urban green park, a neighbourhood equipped area of play, two local equipped areas of play and a local area of play. There are three different character residential areas proposed as part of the reserve matters application and they're referred to lower parklands, upper parklands and river glen. So this just shows the layout of the lower parklands character area. And within lower parklands, there will be a total of 254 units, 212 of which are affordable and 42 private. The dwellings have been designed that will have a frontage onto the avenue and the boulevard, which are the main development roads located between the town park and upper parklands. So this is the upper parklands character area, which fronts onto the boulevard and is bounded by the main local distributor roads serving the site on two sides. This character area has a total of 38 affordable dwellings and 272 social dwellings and apartments. There is a large green urban square of open space, which provides an equipped area of play. And this is framed by single storey dwellings with direct pedestrian connections leading to the high street. This will be completed by the occupation of 420 dwelling units as per the obligations of the Section 76 legal agreement. And the other character area is River Glen. This part of the site is west of the main distributor road. It is steeply sloping with the topography falling to the south of the site in which there is an existing water course which defines the boundary adjacent to zoned recreation and open space lands. River Glen comprises of 148 social dwellings and also provides strategic open space along the water course and pedestrian connections throughout and retention of trees in the site boundaries. There will also be a local area of play and a local equipped area of play in River Glen, and this will be provided in line with the modified Section 76 legal agreement and will be completed prior to the next phase of development, which would be the upper parklands. So this slide just shows you the proposals for the High Street. The Dairy Area Plan 2011 allowed for the provision of two local centres on the H2 zoning and the outline concept master plan combined both local centres into a High Street. The High Street is centrally located within the zoning and takes the form of a linear street. This reserve matters includes the first phase of the High Street proposals and will provide a mix of convenience retail, stores, cafe, restaurant, office units, business startup pubs, a gym, residential units and a, and a community centre. And this is just the High Street streetscape elevations which are included within the members report. The High Street will also have an area of public realm, which will be managed and maintained by Braidwater. The High Street provides also for one of the main bus routes through the site, which will be traffic calmed with crossing facilities for cyclists and pedestrians. The High Street will be delivered in line with the obligations of the Section 76 legal agreement and will be commenced at 500 dwellings and completed by 1,150 units. Now, within members packs, there are examples of all the house types and elevations for the 740 proposed dwellings, but the agent has now submitted CGIs. So the next few slides just show you what the proposed development would look like. So this is the boulevard, which is the main road through the site, connecting upper parklands to the high street and lower parklands. And another CGA of the boulevard. Uh, this is what the proposed high street will look like. 
This is the open space and bungalows at Upper Parklands. This is the farm apartments at Upper Parklands, and this is the main focal building, which fronts onto the green urban square in Upper Parklands. And this is a sample of what the proposed house types would look like in River Glen and also Lower Parklands. So this proposal also provides for a town park, an urban woodland ravine and an urban square. The town park is located within the heart of the H2 zoning and connects directly to the High Street and Lower Parklands from the avenue. It includes the retention of woodland on this part of the site as per the outline CMP. At the entrance to the town park is an urban square, which is a formal urban space, which creates a focal entrance to the town park from the high street. This will be a community events and activity space. And within the town park, there is also a formal neighborhood equipped area of play and mugga pitch proposed. So this plan shows the details of the mugga pitch and the equipment located within the NAEP. The town park will include both formal and informal areas of play, which will be managed and maintained by council as part of the obligations of the Section 76 legal agreement. The details of the play equipment and materials have been agreed with council's green infrastructure team as part of discussions and agreement within this reserve matters application. So this is a CGA of what the community event space um, is as proposed. So in terms of road infrastructure and public transport, as part of the development, there will be a local distributor road within the development as agreed as part of the outline concept master plan. This will be phased in line with the obligations of the legal agreement, which has been modified. Provision of the local distributor road network requires the realignment of Koshquin Road and Whitehouse Roads, which will be stopped up and sections of the road will be abandoned, and the details of these are within the report. There is also the requirement to reconfigure the existing junction between between Koshquin and Whitehouse Road. All of the infrastructure works required include a departure from standards, stopping up abandonment orders, scheme design overview, and traffic regulation orders. And these procedures have been agreed with DFA roads throughout the processing of the application. In terms of public transport, the site will be served by public transport. Within the first phase, there will be six bus stops, two of which are temporary, to facilitate the phasing in line with discussions with Translink. There will also be footway and cycleway connections throughout the site and along the local distributor road network for non-motorised users. So in terms of plan and policy, the site is located on zoned housing land H2. The proposal complies with the area plan policies for housing layouts, design, open space, local centre and retail, community facilities, public transport provision, cycling, protection of trees and woodland. In terms of the house and layout, the proposal meets all of the criteria within PPS 7 and will provide a quality residential environment. There's provision of open space in accordance with PPS 8, which includes a town park and neighbourhood equipped area of play, two local equipped areas of play, one within Upper Parklands and one within River Glen, and an additional local area of play. The open space and play proposals have been agreed with Council's Green Infrastructure Team. HED protect historic monuments have no objection in accordance with PPS 6. DFI Rivers had no objection to the flood risk assessment and drainage assessment submitted as FEA on the application and therefore the proposal complies with PPS 15. In terms of PPS 3, there are adequate access and parking arrangements for the site, provision of public transport cycleways, all in line with the agreed concept master plan. National Environment Division considered the impacts of the proposal on natural heritage interests, including designated sites, bats, badgers, otters, red squirrel, and of no objection subject to conditions. A transboundary consultation with Donegal County Council has also been carried out, and there is no impact on designated sites in the Republic of Ireland. No representations have been received in the application. One non-committal letter was received from number 42 Koshquin Road advising they had no objections to the development. A letter of support was received from the Housing Executive and addressed to APEX dated in April 2022, which confirms that the latest waiting figure lists as of the 31st of March 2022 and confirms support for the proposed housing mix for the 420 social units as proposed within the scheme. Officers also formally consulted the Housing Executive on the application and in a response in April 2022, the Housing Executive advised that the projected housing need for the West Bank is 2885 units and the confirmed support for the mix as proposed 
for the 420 units, which form part of the wider proposal of 740 total units proposed for this application. So, in summary, there's no objections from consultees subject to conditions. This reserve matters application is in broad conformity with the outline concept master plan for the H2 zoning. The DFA roads conditions, which are within the report, remain in draft form until the scheme design overview, the departure from standards, and the PSDs have been signed off. Officer's recommendation is to approve the application. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, uh, for a comprehensive report. Members, um, we do have uh, online with us uh, Tom Stokes, the agent, and uh, Barry Grogan and Sean Foy on behalf of the applicants. So, uh, gentlemen, you're you're very welcome, uh, and uh, I'll open the floor up to yourselves now. Um, so, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just check you can hear me okay? Yep, you're coming through loud and clear. Perfect. <clears throat> Chair, members, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to address the committee this afternoon. I'm joined today by Fumbar Grogan, who's the Planning and Technical Director of Braidwater, and Sean Foy, as you've heard, who's Director of Traffic and Transport and Environment at Atkins. As you'll all be aware, the Braidwater Group is a locally based company specialising in the delivery of high quality homes. The company have a proven track record of effective delivery both in this council area and wider Northern Ireland. The Braidwater Group is leading on the delivery of H2, which when considering the history of this extensive zoning is a highly ambitious project of significant scale. Since the adoption of the Dairy Area Plan in 2000, which is now nearly over 20 years ago, the H2 lands has remained one of the most difficult zonings to unlock for a multitude of reasons, not least the huge upfront infrastructural costs with the Braidwater Group leading in this project, this is now possible, and the importance of this key milestone today should not be underestimated in seeing the vision for these lands being realised. It is also important to note that this is the only zoning within the city which includes the requirement to deliver mixed use, mixed tenure development, and the Braidwater Group is absolutely committed to delivering such a scheme. Braidwater, Braidwater's vision for these lands, which many members may have heard referred to as the Cashel, has been to create a sustainable environment for this new community that deliver, to, by delivering a mix of facilities, including a high street, land set aside for a school, parks and play facilities, all alongside new family homes. In tandem with the delivery of high quality infrastructure, which will include realigned White House and Coshquin roads, new spine roads, cycleways and pedestrian connections, along with the bus service. Permeability is at the heart of the scheme to ensure that residents have access to all of the facilities that the development will have to offer once, once developed out. The scale of the castle proposal is huge and is set to have a positive impact on this city in the wider Northwest. The proposal offers a unique opportunity by seeking to deliver a large scale mixed use and mixed housing tenure development. The castle will be the first of its kind not only in the Northwest, but across the entirety of Northern Ireland, where you'll have different tenures on the same street. The reserve matters, as you've heard from your officer before you today, is for phase one, which comprises 740 new homes, a mix of social, affordable and private, broken up into different character areas. Delivery of the high street, which will include a mix of convenience, retail shops, coffee shops, live work units, and a community space, and part of the delivery of the town park, as well as other play parks and linear walkways and cycleways. Out of the 740 dwellings proposed through this phase one scheme, this phase will deliver 420 social dwellings, 250 affordable and 70 private, and will therefore go some way to addressing the ever increasing social housing waiting list across the city. This phase one proposal in itself is a hugely significant investment of around 100 million pounds with the overall cash flow development comprising an investment of around £450 million from Braidwater. The scheme will support and sustain 250 construction jobs and apprenticeships in the local area for the next 10 years, with the economic impact set to positively benefit suppliers and subcontractors in the area. As members can imagine, it has been no simple task to get to this point today, and we have to say a massive thanks to your officers and all the stakeholders and consultees for their time and effort 
in processing this application diligently, and we respectfully ask members to endorse the officer recommendation. Thank you all for your time, and Finbar, Sean, and myself are all online to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks for coming along today as well. Members, um, uh, a couple of indicated uh, speakers, I'm assuming it's questions uh, to the uh, to the agent here. So, uh, Councillor Dobbins will take you first, then I'll go with you next, uh, Councillor Jackson. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks very much for that, Tom. But I think it's as you said, Sean Foy was um, in charge of the roads uh, there. So, uh, this is directed at him. Um, unfortunately, on my screen here, I cannot determine the roads um, leading in to um, this development. And having family who live um, in the vicinity of White House Park, that road, that turn on to White House Park from Bunkrana Road uh, is so pl problematic that, um, and there has been quite a number of accidents. Can I ask Sean, um, if he could sort of ex explain maybe um, how this development is going to sit and how the road infrastructure is actually going to sit well with the, the surrounding area. And can I also con commend all of you. Um, it is a sustainable uh, environment and with 420 social units there, you know, we do have to really dig in and chip away and do more than chipping away. Um, of the, the deficit that we have throughout the city of social housing, but they have a mixed development here. It's, it's working elsewhere. So, um, so yeah, it, it is a beautiful plan, but I'm just concerned about the road. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Uh, Sean, that's a question for yourself there. Yeah, Chair, Councillors. Um, yes, I, I can confirm that the, the primary access to the site will in fact be off the Skeg roundabout. Um, so that the intention, as we've said, there will be changes in the vicinity of the Korsh, Quinn and White House Road area. So th there, there's certainly been no additional traffic in that vicinity um, as a result of the development. So all of the traffic will be coming directly off um, the A2 Bunkrana Road, off the, the existing Skeg roundabout with some modifications and joining the local distributor road network within the site. In the full uh, sort of course of time, um, as as the development moves forward, there will be a secondary access again directly off the Bunkrana Road, um, further up um, towards the the border area, um, and that will tie in with the, the in parallel. We've been consulting with DFI Roads with respect to their um, sort of longer term proposals to upgrade um, the A2 Bunkrana Road. And there will be, as I said, a secondary access uh, for the roundabout, which will tie into that, which will get, again just facilitate enhanced accessibility to the site. But there, there certainly, um, given the, the location uh, the councillor mentioned there, there certainly uh, won't be any additional traffic, and uh, and potentially there there may there may possibly be some traffic relief in there. But it's certainly um, all development traffic will be using um, the Skeg um, roundabout to come into the site. Okay, thank you. I saw you okay. Thank you. Christopher, uh, Councillor Jackson. Carmel, the chair, and can I take this opportunity to, to wish you well in the year ahead? Um, I want to thank Tom and, and, and the team for, for, for coming to the committee today and congratulate you all on what is a real top quality application that's in front of us. Um, I know that the length of time I've been on this committee and a long time before that, the H2 site has been um, discussed at length within this, this council and the legacy council. Um, it is key to addressing the social housing need within our, our, the, within our city and it's, it's fantastic to say, I was delighted to see that this was in the schedule today. There are just a few questions in in regard to, to the the makeup. Um, we we anticipated that there would be a high level of of social housing in the first reserve matters application, um, which uh, following the changes to the section seventy six agreement, and 
uh, uh, and I'm particularly delighted to see um, that there is there, there remains a mix of, of 250 affordable home, homes. Um, I just want to ask Tom or whoever's, uh, whoever would be most appropriate, what way are those um, affordable homes made up? Are, are they going to take the form of, of co-ownership or are they, um, or, or is there any um, design um, mechanism they, they roll out the affordable homes? Um, there was um, discussion or there was a mention of apprenticeships is there any social clauses or is there um or is there anything that Braidwater um plan to do in terms of quantifying the number of apprenticeships and ensuring that those apprenticeships are coming from the local area because um there's this 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 application um it's it's long it's there's there's it's been long anticipated um and it could be key not only the 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 unlocking the this uh, and addressing the social housing crisis that we're experiencing, but um, it, it could have a massive impact on the local economy. So to ensure that, that the right people um, will get supported through out, out of all of this, um, is there any is there any plans from the developers to ensure that they try and support local people from the local area? Um, but in, in, in terms of the of the application that's in front of me, I, I think I think from this committee, I, I, and I, I don't want to preempt anything, but um, I just want to congratulate everybody that was in, involved on it. it. It is a real top quality application. I know I, I've went on the portal a, a few times to check progress and what I'm on on this application in particular, and the level of detail that's good that. that that's that's contained within the portal itself just shows the how the scale of this application and the number of different com considerations not only the applicant had to consider but our planning team as well so um it's it, it's brilliant that we're at this stage and i just want to congratulate everybody that played a part in getting this here so thanks chair okay thank you uh councillor jackson um Tom Finbar, I think probably you're the man who might have the answers to some of those questions, if not all of them. So again, back to yourselves. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Jackson, for the kind um, words. I'll maybe cover off um, a few of the points, and then um, I see Finbar has appeared there, so um, he can come in where appropriate. In terms of the affordable um, housing, I suppose that's the smaller house types, and as Councillor Jackson has already referred to, um, those would be below the within the co-ownership um, threshold. Um, social clauses are maybe one more for Finbar uh, chair, but I suppose we're talking about a local company, and I know they obviously use local suppliers um, and local subcontractors. From Bar can maybe comment a bit more on that in terms of the other obviously have other live um sites within the study as well too. Um he might be able to say a bit more on that. Okay, thanks for that, Tom. Uh, you've uh, you've taken all the answers that I had scribbled down. So yes, on the on the affordable element, the those homes would be lower cost, more financially affordable, and yes, they would be they would include um co ownership. And on the apprentices front, I suppose there's a, a thing called buy buy social that that we sub subscribe to, and that that we have been involved in across a range of sites, where there's um, apprenticeships and opportunities open uh, offered to uh, like long term unemployed um, school leavers, and there's a range of different categories. So. Um, we have implemented that scheme ac across a range of uh, developments, and that in turn is monitored monitored by the Department for Social Development (DSD). So, and, and then I suppose finally, I suppose Tom's mentioned as well that I suppose we are a local company, and we employ uh, local direct employees, uh, subcontractors, and indeed suppliers and consultants and whatnot. So. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Finbar. I think it certainly does, Councillor Jackson.
Come briefly, please. Just a, a quick uh, supplementary to that. Um, has, has, there, has there been any consideration given to um, a partnership approach with the, the local Northwest um, Regional College or, or even ourselves as a council through um, the Business and Culture Committee just around um, that apprenticeship scheme? Thank you, Professor Jackson. Um, Funbar, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, well, we would have strong links with the uh, Northwest College and um, I suppose on the bi social front and, and a range of other stuff, um, school leavers and whatnot. But I suppose uh, we'd be up for that. Um, we, we do it anyway, but I suppose there's nothing formally in, in place or it wouldn't. Wouldn't normally be a conditioner or whatnot, but we, we do it anyway, as a matter of course. Okay. Okay, Councillor Jackson, we'll, we'll move on. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks for that. Van Bar, thanks for answering those. Um, okay, my next indicated speakers, uh, Councillor McKinney, and then uh, Councillor Logan, come to you after that. Thank you very much, Chair and uh, Tom. Uh, this is a great application. It's well welcomed. I'm sure everybody in the in this chamber will welcome it. Um, I just have one question, really. It's for Sean. I'm sort of a bit of an anorak when it comes to uh, roads and stuff. And I'm just wanting to know, you're going to do realignment of the A2 or be involved in realignment. When do you propose to start doing that? Is it once you've built so many houses? Maybe I've missed it on the presentation, but uh, I'd just like to know when you sort of intend to start doing that, because I do believe there's a bit of a, quite a bottleneck at the minute in that area and it may increase quite a bit once we start building the house and putting people in them so if you maybe could answer that for me please yeah thanks for the question councillor mckinney um yes i suppose that just to clarify we've been working um closely i think as the planning officer had suggested with dfi roads throughout this process it, it is in fact dfi roads who are coming forward with the overall scheme for the a2 albeit um that the, the development is making a contribution towards financial contribution towards uh, the upgrade of the road. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, the timeline for the delivery of that scheme is uh, outside of, of our direct control and, and uh, remains with DFI roads. But we're certainly very supportive and uh, quite a bit of time has been invested um, to date to ensure that the um, the development proposals, uh, the road access, um, are totally in alignment um, with the DFI roads proposals. But as I say, unfortunately, we're we're not driving that scheme forward. It certainly is a substantial upgrade to the road network, um, and and I, and I couldn't say at this stage just what the the exact time frames are that the DFI roads are are working to. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, uh, Councillor Oak, uh, I'll uh, go to you. Thank you, Chair. And um, just a few questions. And I suppose, um, like the other councillors, uh, first of all, I just want to welcome this much needed uh, development, especially uh, it's going to be mixed use uh, and mixed uh, tenure. Um, I suppose the most pressing uh, question I would have would be around the NI water and the, the capacity. I do note in the consultations and I, well, there was issues and they have said that um, they are planning an upgrade. And at the end of the, the, uh, this paragraph, it's, it's saying that um, the NI water are content um, to um, uh, solutions. Uh, the, the, they, are, they are content with the application and that they have agreed solutions. Um, but I, I would be aware that they are also saying that, you know, connections could be curtailed. So it has been said that, you know, a lot of people have been waiting on this development and a lot of work has gone on it by everyone. Can you maybe just explain the timeline uh, of when I, NI Water are going to commence those upgrades? And um, what other solutions um, have they come up with, or are they dependent on yourselves um, to to do the upgrade? Just on another 
on another question, it, it's saying each neighbourhood will have its own uh, distinctive style. Um, can you just explain that a wee bit? Will the, the quality of the materials um, be different from the private to the social? And I uh, see that you know they are, the, the materials will be high quality, but I just wanted to know as there are going to be a difference. And one last question, as I can't see it and I have looked and I don't think there is, but is there going to be any masonite type uh, properties? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Logue, uh, again, back over to yourselves there, gentlemen. A couple of questions there for you. Perhaps, Chair um, Sean Foy, again, maybe I'll just answer the one with respect to NI Water. Again, I, th I think um, Councillor Logue has correctly identified there has been a lot of discussion with NI Water, I think particularly directly um, by Braidwater themselves to understand, given the scale of this development and um, the importance of it um, to the city, um, to see how the development could come forward and align with the infrastructure requirements and the plans that NI Water have. I think originally there was some um, discussion and, and design work undertaken, particularly with respect to waste, as to whether there was a need to um, develop a, any sort of treatment works uh, or pumping stations or with res internally within the site to support the, the application. I think in the, in the, in the course of time, um, and with the discussions with Braidwater, it was identified that NI Water um, were coming forward with their own upgrade proposals that would enable us uh, simply to provide the appropriate connections and tie-ins. So um, all of that sort of has um, sort of smoothed out as the process uh, has come forward. And so, uh, again, it's ultimately ended up with um, the support and approval of, of NI Water in terms of uh, ensuring that infrastructure um, will be in play uh, at the appropriate time as required by the development. No, I, I might uh, shoot in in front of Tom there now uh, and follow up on that to do with any water. So I suppose the, the, the task at hand with, with the planning uh, has been considerable and, and hopefully we're nearing uh, a deliberation on that, but I suppose there are indeed further tasks to follow. And I suppose the sewer main upgrades in the dairy area and the water main upgrades that are necessary, we have had lengthy correspondence and meetings and whatnot with any water and there are designs there are draft designs at hand uh, uh, any water have applied for money under a scheme pc21 from from stormont and um i suppose we are assured that the the works will follow the the target date is some something of the order of of 2023 is, is what they're expecting. So it will be in advance of our first homes, which I suppose with the most considerable civil engineering challenges with the site for cut and fill in one thing or another and the, the works that are required on White House Road, um, we're happy that that'll fit in with, with our programme, but there'll be lengthy communication and collaboration and um, coaxing and cajoling required to just get that all boxed off and um, there's there's money at hand to understand for the first year of pc21 for any water from from stormont and then i think that has to be argued on every year and whatnot so that maybe gives a wee bit of a f more flavor on the the details of the the any water but yes there are upgrains required in terms of of water mains which um uh, need upgraded um to serve our site and also the the wider uh area and and indeed then the the sewage which has to there's a there's a new pumping station to go in on uh the bunk road and there's an intention to pump away across to um like skeg industrial estate like lenamore area so that's that's that and uh, maybe just picking up on there was a mention there of of uh, finishes and quality of finishes and would the social be less than the uh, private and the answer is no that's a key uh, part of this dis uh, design that the whole thing would be 10 year blind is, is the term that has been used so that you wouldn't be able to distinguish between uh, any of any of the the different 10 years so no there wouldn't be lesser materials or lesser finishes used and um 
There was also mention there of, of masonettes. And yes, there are some uh, apartments within this scheme. I suppose the social element, um, the, the splits and, and the makeup of that, there was a request from the housing executive, so they dictated what the mix would be. So yes, they, there are some apartments in it, but they are, um, Tom, you might have the numbers there, but they're circa 100, but they are all on-door um, units so that, that um, there are no communal entrances and that type of thing that would be found elsewhere. And I suppose that's something. The on-door element has been found to be um, less problematic to date. So yes, so there, there are some in the circle one side. Okay, uh, thanks, Fenbar. Uh, um, Councillor Logie, you want to come back in again? Go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for that clarification. But just to, to be certain, I'm, I was talking about a masonette where you have a, an apartment or a flat underneath a two story, uh, what would be classed as a house, even though they would have their own doors. I do know that there is that type of uh, building in other areas. Um, newly built areas of the city and there there has been issues um so can you just clarify that i understand there be two story apartments with their own door but would there be what is classed as a house on top of a, an apartment formerly known as masonettes no that's I'll not try and answer that one first sorry i brought it in there as Chair, no, there are not. There are none of that particular dwelling type on this site. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that, and also about the tenure blind. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Oak. I'm happy to hear about that as well. I share your view. Um, are there any other members who might have questions for the um, the applicant, uh, Councillor Mooney? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I think it could be directed to. Um, Bar, but just like on my, on my own behalf, welcome the application. Um, it's great news. Um, it's been brought before us, but it was just one thought occurred to me. It may sound silly, but it's probably a hypothetical. If there was a slow uptake on the affordable scheme, um, I don't anticipate there would be, mind you, but if there was, could those allocations be reapportioned to maybe the house, social housing element of the project? Or um, it was just was a thought occurred to me, and I thought if there was any possible, you know, Slow, there are slow applications for the affordable end of the scheme. Could they be transferred, or as there a provision that you have in the plan ready for that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mooney. Uh, again, uh, about yourself there, Funbar, one for you, briefly. No, there would be no intention to, to follow that path. Um, I suppose we've talked about mixed tenure and tenure blind and whatnot, and I suppose with the lack of, of larger scale um, sites for sale in the city side over this last while, I suppose since the last crash, we're, you know, we're, we, we don't expect that that would be the case, or we do not intend to, to go down that path. We expect the, you know, the splits to say, stay as they are with the um, private, affordable and social. Thank you. Okay. Okay, summary. Thank you. Okay, members, I have no other indicated speakers in relation to the, um, the applicant here. So again, I'll, I'll open it up to the floor if any of you have any questions for uh, Sarah at this point. And if you don't, that's fine too. Uh, go ahead, you don't, you do. You don't have a question, okay. Uh, but you do want to speak now, of course. Uh, Councillor Jackson, go ahead. Uh, Chair, in the absence of any questions, um, I'm delighted to be able to, I'm delighted, as, as I've said, to see the application come in front of us today. Um, it's it's been a long time coming, um, but given the scale of it, it's completely understandable. Um, and as as we as what as what has been well rehearsed, um, there's this site the the H two zoning in general is key in terms of addressing or going a step towards addressing the housing need within our city. Um, um, th there's in terms of planning policy, in my view, there uh, this application um, meets 
every every plan and policy. But when it, um, it's it's well designed. It's a high quality application, and um, I'm more than content to propose that we accept a recommendation from the officer. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Uh, Councillor Dobbins. Thank you for that, Madam Chair, and I'd like to um, second uh, Christopher's proposal there. I would also like to add, um, I I am a bit disappointed on one thing, um, and this is for the developers, um, rather than we signed, well, no, I'm going to sound like what we did at the Old Dairy City Council when myself and, and the then councillor, Tony Hassan, there's no bungalows in this in this development. There is. You see, can't see it. <laughs> I'm having difficulty in seeing this, but then I retract that and I do apologize. And I'm grateful that there is bungalows because that is what we need in, in every development, a good mixture. So I apologize for that, but happy to second uh, Christopher's proposal there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Dobbins. And at the risk of um um, promoting uh, one of the local opticians, perhaps spec savers would have come in handy. I am joking, I am joking, of course, Councillor Dobbins. Um, uh, so again, thank you, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Dobbins. Just actually reflecting on this myself, I mean, this has been uh, a project that has been very, very long uh, and, and the common gentlemen, and I, I understand, of course, that um, the challenges of, of particular period in the history of, of development um, uh, uh, made it very protracted and of course no uh, no blame could be attached to yourselves in relation to that um, but uh, it's great to see that it that it is progressing and progressing so very very positively um, H2 has been discussed for a very long time longer than I've been on this council and I'm sitting in these seats nearly 12 years now in fact uh, somebody was reflecting earlier on that um, when the ambitious plans for the H2 site started out, uh, there were children being born, and now they're perhaps uh, of an age where they're shaving. Um, so uh, that's how long it has taken. But we're here, uh, and that's that's a good thing. There's a proposal in front of us, members. I don't suspect anyone's going to vote against it, but of course I will deal with formality of a proposal from Councillor Jackson, seconded by uh, Councillor Dobbins. Put it to the floor, members. Um, are we all in favour of uh, the recommendation to approve? And if not, of course, do you indicate now? Okay, members. Uh, there were a number of matters in relation to conditions that I, that I think I'm going to pass over to Andre just to explain to you. I don't feel that you'll have any problem with it, but uh, for the, again, for the formality of it. Apologies, Andre. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, members, I just wanted um, to ask for members' agreement. Um, as you would have heard in Sarah's presentation, um, we do have draft conditions from DFI Roads. Um, and there are some of the conditions which may need very minor alterations. Um, and if members would allow officers delegated authority just in going forward and, and issuing the approval, um, that we can um, add to and amend. There won't be any change in the substance of the conditions, um, but there will be slight amendments. So just if we have members' authority to do that as officers. Thank you, Andre. I don't, I don't see anyone. Yeah, uh, great. Go ahead, thank you. Yep, uh, Councillor Logue, I think you speak for all of us there. We're content to rest on that, on that basis, Andre. So again, thank you to that. Uh, all that remains for me to do is to thank uh, Tom, Funbar uh, and Sean for coming and presenting uh, this particular uh, development for our approval at this point. I wish you well with uh, the rest of the plans. Um, and uh, that's that. Members, we are going to move on. I'm going to suggest we take a break here. Um, for 10 minutes or so. And so it is now exactly 10 past four. So the ambition would be that we'll return at 20 past or thereabouts. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thank you, members. So um, we're moving on to uh, the next planning application, LA 11, 2022 uh, 0112F. Uh, it's for an approval, the demolition of the Riverside Stadium. Uh, and Rosie is going to present the report for us now. Sorry about that. Um, good afternoon, members. Item three is LA 11 2022 0112F, and it's for the demolition of the Riverside Stadium um, and its return to greenfield use at, River, at the Riverside Stadium on 51 Glen Shane Road, the YMCA Drumahoe, and the recommendation to, is to approve. Um, the application is before members this afternoon as this is an application for major development. So the site is the former grounds of the Institute Football Club and the club ceased to use the site following the floods in August 2017. The club now seeks permission to demolish and remove the stadium, um, the buildings, the stands and the floodlights from the site and restore it to grassland. So this, uh, these slides here just show what the condition of the site is like at the minute. Um, that's the main stadium building, so all of these are to be uh, removed from the site. And this slide just lists there um, the demolition works that are to take place and remove um, everything from the site. So the site um, is located in the countryside outside the settlement development limits of the city. And it's on lands that were approved for playing field use as far back as 1981. So you can see here um, in the middle of the photograph, that is the Institute football grounds with the YMCA building at this location. And these are the former lands that were um, in playing field use, but they uh, ceased use again after the 2017 floods and been returned to uh, grazing lands. You can see there that the River Fahan flows just to the south of the site. So the, the immediate rear boundary of the site sits along um, the, uh, the special area of conservation and the area of special scientific interest. Um, and because of these designations, careful consideration has been given to the method and the timing of the demolition works to prevent uh, potential environmental impacts on the River Fahan. So the demolition works proposed involved a soft tear down where the methods um, will be employed, like you know, removing the stands, uh, the seating within the stands by hand, and careful dismantling of the floodlights. Um, and it's proposed these kinds of elements of the site would be reused. Um, then the fountains will be uh, dug out using rock hammering, but along here where the boundary is with the special area of conservation, uh, there'll be no intrusive excavations um, along the River Fahan. So all equipment then as well to be, to be used in the demolition works will be sited within the pitch grounds and not on the river bank to afford protection. So in addition to um, there's a number of other designations pertaining to the site. Um, it's within the floodplain of the River Fahan, and it's in an area of high scenic value as designated in the Dairy Area Plan. So the details of the application and the assessment of policy are set out in the report before members. Um, and this slide just provides a summary of all the aspects that have been considered. So the site is um, established open space by virtue of the approved plan and history for use as playing pitches. And under policy OS1 of PPS8, there is a, a presumption against the loss of open space. So officers consider that whilst the formal sporting use of the site will be removed, the site still performs a function as open space by provising, providing a visual amenity in accordance with Annex A3 of PPS8. So for these reasons, officers are satisfied that the development doesn't result in a loss of open space. The site is also within the floodplain of the River Fahan, and a flood risk assessment was submitted with the application and assessed by DFI Rivers. And in that report, it advises that because of the requirement to dig out the foundations, the site will require some backfilling and leveling out with um, soil, and it'll then be grassed out. Um, as stated within the flood risk assessment, the backfilling must not exceed the existing ground levels, and this is necessary to ensure that any possible increase in ground levels wouldn't um, impact on any flood risk at the site. So officers rec recommended a condition uh, to ensure that the backfilling with clay and soil levels don't exceed existing ground levels. Um, the import then of 
uh, sorry, the agent has explained, as I say, that because of the requirement to dig out the fines, there'll be, I suppose, holes or gaps left in the, the surface of the soil and, or the surface of the site. And this will be filled with clay and subsoil, and then the lands return to their original grassed over condition. Um, officers are satisfied that in accordance with the policies WD1 of the Dairy Area Plan and policy WM4 of PPSL11, that the disposal of material at the site will result in land improvement. Only inert clear soil will be used to avoid any um, adverse environmental impact. In respect of local need, as advised in the statement of community involvement, the demolition is supported by the local community to eliminate the antisocial behaviour and vandalism which has occurred at the site. And officers are satisfied that only the minimum quantity of fill necessary to achieve the proposed improvements shall be deposited, thereby ensuring the flood risk to the site or elsewhere is not increased and there's no visual impact arising from land raising. As the site was formerly maintained glass, grassland for football use, it's not considered that it, there'll be any um, adverse impact on biodiversity by returning it to grassland. The site is also located within an area of high scenic values designated in the area plan. Um, and officers consider there'll be no adverse impact on the quality or character of the landscape as a result of the demolition works and consider that there will be a visual enhancement to the area by the removal of buildings which have been lying vacant for a number of years. In respect of natural heritage, um, the proximity of the site to the River Fahan Special Area of Conservation and Area of science, uh, Special Scientific Interest is acknowledged, and there's a potential for degradation um, of the river during or due to runoff during contamination works. But because of the potential for any impact on the Fahan, um, the permitted development rights to demolish the structures didn't apply on this case. Um, as the demolition uh, requires special sensitivity and the, the application and all the documents with it have taken full, full cognizance of um, the sensitivity at the site. So NIEA and SES have assessed the manner in which the project is to be carried out and advised that the project would not have any adverse effect on the integrity of any European site. And officers recommend a condition requiring the submission of a final construction environmental management plan which details the methods to employ during demolition works to ensure protection of the environment is afforded. In respect of any priority or pri um, protected species, there were a number of reports accompanying the application and NIEA advises that they are content that the proposal will not have a significant impact on bats, otters, birds, and there were no evidence of badgers at the site. In respect of access, the existing access onto Glen Shane Road will be used by the construction traffic um, and DFI roads have no objection. Um, in regards to residential amenity, rock hammering will be used at the site and this is the potential to impact on residential amenity due to noise and dust. And environmental health have recommended a condition requiring the submission of a construction environmental management plan detailing how noise and dust uh, measures will be put in place. So officers consider that on balance, the proposal is acceptable and recommend approval subject to the conditions set out in the planning report. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Um, members, are, um, there is a, a speaker available to you on behalf of the applicant, Mark McIver. Uh, Mark Iver. Uh, the agent, Mark, um, if you want to uh, address a committee, I invite you to do so now. Thank you for that, Chair, and good afternoon, members and uh, planning officers. Uh, I'd just like to extend a thank you to Rosie for that comprehensive uh, planning summary. Um, uh, speaking on behalf of the applicant, uh, Institute Football Club, the planning application itself was submitted in January of this year, and the speed at which this has been brought to planning committee is, uh, I think, a reflection of actually not only the hard work that's taken place within the council and the statutory consultees, but it's important to mention that the preparation for the application has gone back well into the past, uh, right back to when the original PAD meeting took place. So whilst this has arrived at, at planning committee in a very short number of months, what, I, what I've explained to others is that the bulk of the work took place in the preparation status. So we're, we're absolutely delighted to be here today. Um, in terms of Institute Football Club, they, they are a community uh, club. Uh, obviously, they've been 
operating from the application site in Drumahoe since 1980. Uh, over that period of years, they've been heavily invested uh, building the stadium up from what was originally a grass pitch to what it is today uh, with four stands. Uh, it was suitable for Irish League football. Obviously, the club were devastated by the floods in 2017 and failure thereafter to get uh, suitable flood insurance. And what, what that is effectively called into question is the future uh, viability and sustainability of the club operating from this site. So any further investment into the stadium was rendered impossible. And the club made the difficult decision um, on the back of, of those circumstances uh, and with one eye on protecting the long term viability of the club to look elsewhere within the city and particularly the waterside area for a suitable alternative site. So getting this planning permission today to commence demolition and return those lands back to their original use would be the first step in assisting the club with their journey, which currently they, they are sharing the Brandywell Stadium, but ultimately they want to return to the waterside area and support from council today would, would bring that closer to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that, Mark. Uh, I suppose in many senses, uh, as, as you've outlined, uh, this application coming before the planning committee comes with some degree of mixed emotions, um, certainly for the followers of Institute Football Club, but I, I think I could speak broadly for the, for the wider population and indeed the wider sporting uh, community in our city. Uh, it uh, has come around by necessity, uh, following clearly the very devastating floods of, of 2017 that we all in this uh, chamber uh, remember so well. Uh, and Institute were, of course, not the only victim of that particular event, um, but here we find uh, ourselves in this particular situation. Um, so uh, the recommendation in front of us, obviously, is, is to approve uh, the request from Institute Football Club. But of course, at this point, Mark, I'm going to open it up to the floor to members to see if anybody would like to ask you any questions. So again, uh, over to yourselves, members. Is there many? Thank you, Chair. And just a, a question for uh, Mark, the agent. Um, just to like to echo your sentiments, this is probably a, a better speed application as such because of the devastation that was wreaked by um, those floods at that time. And obviously, um, we're glad to see this application is coming forward today. Um, they, they, um, they reset the local um, site down there. But I would just noted one comment on page 169, and it's, it was actually uh, in relation to the intended uh, waste products that's going to be generated by the site disposal. And I'm sort of glad to see that what it says is intended to reduce waste and, and the agent considers the quantum of material which can be salvaged is considerable. And that's obviously seating and flood light and the dugout, et cetera. But I'm just wondering, could you maybe give us a certain quantification on that? What percentage of the materials can be reused and recycled? Because obviously um, that's a very, you know, it's, it's a good aspect of this application that a lot of material that's there can be reused and used somewhere else. So I was wondering, would you be able to maybe give us a percentage quantification on that, Mark, if it's possible? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can you go ahead, Mark. I can certainly try and answer um, the question. I can't give a precise percentage. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. We don't currently have a completed or finalized proposed scheme for the site that we have earmarked, and therefore we can't currently say X percent will definitely be reused because that, that scheme would still need to pass through planning and get your support at a future date. So for, for example, if I was to suggest that all of one of the particular stands was, was to be reused, and then you find that you didn't support the reuse of that stand because of its juxtaposition with nearby properties, then, then it's difficult to say. But the sentiment of the applicant and indeed the project team has been throughout this process to look at what 
can be salvaged. Um, a lot of money and a lot of grant funding has gone into this stadium to this date, and no one wants to see that end up in landfill. So the discussions we've had with the applicant is where possible, anything that can be reused will be reused within reason. So that does extend to the floodlights, that does extend to the seating, uh, it does extend to some of the technical equipment that's actually within the main stand at the moment. Uh, so there's, there's a strong desire and there is a, a project, a project sheet that the, the architect is currently working off with a view to relocating much of what can be salvaged onto the new site. Um, I don't want to start talking too much about the new site because then that in itself will set us in another conversation about the suitability of the site. Uh, it, it's unfair to to others and 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 today I want to focus on on this particular site at, at Drumaho. So the sentiment is there to reduce waste as much as possible. Uh, it will reduce costs on the applicant, but ultimately it's a sustainability uh, preference to reuse as much as possible. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for that. Any other members? If there aren't, um, um, bear with me. Uh, yeah, that's that, that's uh, and thanks for that ladder. But um, we have a question for the officer coming up, uh, Mark. But uh, nobody else has any questions for you at that point. Uh, and just to say yes, uh, uh, in relation to whatever the future site is, I wasn't going to go there today either. That's a different application anyway. So uh, we'll, I think we'll 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 stick to this one for now. Um, so again, uh, thank you. Don't have any other indicated questions for you, Mark. So thanks for uh, coming along to answer. Um, but do you stay with us? So, um, uh, Councillor uh, Kelly, um, do you have a question for Rosie? You'd like to go ahead? Thank you, Chair. Uh, and it was remiss of me uh, to uh, not congratulate you on your uh, election to chair of the committee uh, when I was talking previously. So congratulations. Uh, my question is, yeah, we've been advised on a number of occasions, uh, particularly in regard uh, to remediation of wind turbine sites, that leaving and covering up um, the concrete substructure is a better environmental solution. Uh, and given the, the, the sensitive nature of the site beside the fawn, I'm curious and uh, keen to know why removal of the concrete substructure is regarded as a better environmental outcome in this case. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kelly, through the Chair. Um, it's proposed that the foundations that are along the riverside will be actually left in, site, uh, in place so that they will be uh, covered over and soiled over again. So it's particularly in respect of the sensitivity at the river because rock hammering can cause a number of issues for um, fish species and for otters that might be, you know, tra 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 traversing the bank there. So those foundations will be left in place. Um, the foundations for the floodlights are particularly deep um, to afford them stability, so they 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 will be left in place as well. Thank you. Okay, you all right with that, Councillor Kelly? Thanks for that clarification. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Any other questions for the officer? Sir Mooney. Chair, uh, unless anybody else has any. Questions. I'm happy to propose the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And uh, seconded by um, uh, Councillor McKinney. Members, again, I don't see anybody indicating that they're opposed to this uh, particular recommendation. Um, so uh, go ahead, Councillor Jackson. Chair, yeah, I'm fully support, supportive of the proposal that was made and I'm um, seconded, but, but because I was caught up by a full call. Um, and I wasn't here for the entirety of the presentation. I read the report, um, but I wasn't here for the entirety of the, the, the presentation. So they, for, not they have the decision questioned. Um, I'm going to abstain from the, the vote. Chair, um, I had to pop out as well. So 
firm is signing the dips team as well. Okay, then we're going to have to find a similar seconder then, uh, Councillor Dobbins. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're going to exclude uh, Councillor Jackson and Councillor McKinney on the basis that for no other good reason than that you weren't here for the very beginning. And of course, that is in keeping with the actual uh, protocol. If you're not in the room at the beginning of the report, then of course you can't vote. Mm -hmm. um, and that happens sometimes, um, but uh, so be it. I, I also appreciate that you're both supportive uh, of it. Um, uh, uh, unless I see anybody indicating other ways that I am going to consider that this uh, is approved unanimously. Um, thank you very much. And again, thank you, uh, Rosie, and thanks for uh, joining us, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Okay, um, moving swiftly along, members. Uh, item four in the agenda for decision today, LA 11 2020 uh, 02520, um, proposed extension of Bally McGrody neighbourhood, etc. Uh, and the report will be presented by Sarah. Item four is LA 11 2020 02520. This is a proposed extension of the Bally McGrody neighbourhood comprising of a residential development with associated open space including a community parkland, pedestrian linkages, access and associated works, with access onto Hewitt Road, Ringfort Road via the adjacent lands, including off-site improvements to O'Donnell Road, Eloch Road Junction and new footpath connection along Eloch Road between O'Donnell Avenue Junction and Eloch Road, Hewitt, Hewitt Avenue Roundabout, and new pedestrian crossing on Eloch Road immediately north of the Holy Family Church. The site is on lands north of Eloch Road, Ennis Place, John Field Place, Rafferty Close, McNeese Close, McGill Court, Swift Court and Anolan Crescent in Ballymagorty. Officer's recommendation is to refuse. A predetermination hearing was held on the application on the 9th of February 2022. At the PDH, members agreed to carry out a site visit and the site visit took place on the 21st of February, the details of which are in members' report. So this is the site location plan. The site is 11.5 hectares. Part of the site is located outside the development limits of the city and is therefore on the countryside. This is identified in the location plan on the slide and that is those lands to the left of the black line which are located on the countryside. The site is outlined in red. The remaining part of the site is on land zoned as, it's, as existing recreation and open space as defined in the Dairy Area Plan 2011. Parts of the site are steeply sloping and the site slopes down towards a stream on the northern boundary, which is defined by mature trees and vegetation. The area is characterised by medium high density housing and there are existing community facilities, including Ballymagorty Community Centre and Council's Playing Pitch and Park are to the south of the site. Immediately to the north of the red line site boundary is the zoned H2 lands. To the east of the application site, Council is also considering an application on the adjacent lands and both applications share an access. That site is also zoned as existing recreation and open space. So the red line in the site location plan was extended to include land required for the external upgrades to the footway network and the extended site location plan is included in members report. So this is a special NI aerial photograph of the site. This is the extract from the Dairy Area Plan Map 2011, showing the application site outlined in red, located on lands zoned for recreation and open space, and also the lands outside the development limit. The H2 zoned lands are immediately adjacent to and north of the site, which it is envisaged that the H2 could deliver up to approximately 3,000 houses. So this is the eastern boundary of the site, and the eastern boundary traverses this field. This part of the field and tree boundary to the right of the photograph is part of the adjoining application site, LA 11 2020 0318. This is one of the fields within the application site with mature trees and vegetation on the boundaries, and the application site comprise, comprises of at least a minimum of 11 separate field parcels. Just another photograph showing that the site is steeply sloping in parts and would require engineering works to accommodate the housing and the road through the site and the application will involve the removal of a significant amount of mature trees throughout the site. Again, a photograph showing the extent of some of the tree vegetation on one of the field boundaries which traverses the site. And this photograph shows some of the fields which are located outside the development limits. 
This is a photograph showing the part of the site which immediately adjoins Ballymagorda Community Centre and the recently upgraded council play facilities. And again, a photograph showing the existing play facilities at Ballymagorda Community Centre. Earlier in the processing of the application, it was proposed that the access to serve the development will cut through a portion of these lands and encroach into the community facilities. The access road has since been amended by the agent and is now proposed through, adjacent, through, through the adjacent planning application site. A pedestrian connection is now proposed in this location. And there are a number of other additional photographs within members' reports. So in terms of consultees, the Housing Executive confirmed support for the proposal, which is based on the wider West Bank Housing Needs Assessment Area. The housing need projection for the West Bank is 2885 units between 2021 and 26. The specific need within Bally Magorte and Hazel Bank CLA as of the 31st of March 2022 was 272 applicants as their first choice, 208 of which are in housing stress. So protecting historic monuments, environmental health, DFA roads, locks, rivers, water management unit, regulation unit, National Environment Division and SES have no objections subject to condition. In terms of NI water, further information was submitted following the predetermination hearing, which included a wastewater impact assessment and outlined foul drainage report, and NI water were reconsulted and now have no objections to the application subject to conditions. There were 217 objections received in the application and the majority of the objections were received in June and July 2020 following the initial neighbour notification. These raised issues such as impact on the community, roads issues, concerns regarding the loss of zoned open space and proximity to the zoned H2 lands, character of the area, community public consultation, infrastructure, sewage and water impacts and a detailed consideration of objections as within members report. 15 letters of support were received on the 15th of March 2022 and in summary consider that the development will provide much needed housing in Ballymagorty. The proposed park will be a boost to the community and provide facilities for families. It will address antisocial behaviour issues, offer supervision, a healthy environment, will have a knock-on effect for businesses, increased employment, will provide safe accessible walks and nature trails and they welcome the revised access plans. So in terms of community consultation, this took place initially between March 19 and March 2020. Following the predetermination hearing, the agents carried out further community consultation on the 15th of March 22. 20 signed letters of support were also included within the submitted documents, which welcomed the revised access road, welcomed the development that previously impacted, was previously impacted by antisocial behaviour, the benefits to the community with much needed housing and new open space areas and additional employment benefits. So this was the agent's initial concept proposal for the site in which the access was proposed via Ennis Place. And this is now the concept proposal which indicates approximately 70 units on land zoned for open space. The black line on the slide indicates the extent of the parkland proposed which is outside the settlement limit as defined in the area plan. The access is now proposed as via the adjacent field and through the adjacent planning application, which is also located on land zoned for existing recreation and open space. The access is via Ringfort Road and Hewitt Road, Hewitt Road, and the point of access is some 300 metres from where the residential element of this proposal is to be located. So in terms of planning policy assessment, this proposal is contrary to the Dairy Area Plan 2011, as it will result in the loss of land zoned for recreation and open space, and it extends the development, limit, development outside the limits and onto the countryside. This major housing proposal does not meet any of the exceptions test in the area plan to allow for bulk development on land zoned for open space, i.e. the major housing development is not related to the existing use, the proposal is not for leisure facilities, and there are no buildings to replace and therefore the proposal is contrary to policy or one of the area plan. Officers also consider that extending the limits of development to provide an urban parkland to offset the loss of land zoned for recreation and open space is not acceptable, and the proposal is therefore contrary to the dairy area plan. And considering the SPPS and PPS 8, policy OS1 is for the protection of open space. The overall aim of the SPPS and PPS8 is to resist the loss of open space to other uses irrespective of its physical condition and appearance. 
An exception will be permitted where it is shown that redevelopment will bring substantial community benefits that decisively outweigh the loss of open space. PPS 8 requires that it also has to be demonstrated that proposals are supported by the local community. The agent considers that the community benefits of the proposal are the provision of the new community park, the social housing need, design addresses antisocial behaviour and cost benefits. So in terms of the community benefits consideration by officers, this proposal will result in the loss of 2.75 hectares of zoned recreation and open space land as defined in the area plan. The park to the west of the proposed housing is located outside the settlement limit. The provision of parkland outside the settlement limit to offset the loss of zoned recreation open space inside the limits is not acceptable. It was not the intention or the spirit of policy that the development limits could be extended to accommodate a housing application with open space to justify the loss of zoned existing recreational uses inside the limit. The entrance access at Hewitt Road and Ringfort Road is a significant distance from the location of the housing as proposed and is located approximately 300 metres from the access location and 180 metres to the boundary of the adjacent site. In considering design and antisocial behaviour issues, the agent considers that the land poses a negative public value as a result of antisocial behaviour and from fly tipping on visual amenity, ecological amenity and residential amenity in the area. However, officers would consider that the site is of public as of significant public value as this site acts as the green lungs between Ballymagorty and the future planned development on the Hitch 2 zoned lands. Antisocial behaviour currently taking place on the site is a matter for the owner of the site and a policing matter, and but it is not so material to justify a community benefit exception under policy to outweigh the loss of zoned open space. PPS 8 does state that irrespective of its physical condition and appearance that there is a presumption against the loss of open space. So in considering the social housing need and the proximity of the site to the H2 zoned lands, this plan um, on the slide above was submitted in March 22, which shows the proposed development adjacent to the H2 site. So the application description of the proposal is not described as being for social housing, although Apex are named as joint applicant with Braidwater. This site is in an area of housing need in the West Bank and the updated figures from the housing executive for the wider West Bank housing needs assessment is 2885 units between 21 and 26. The specific need, however, in Ballymagorty and Hazel Bank as of March 22 is 272 first choice with 208 of these in housing stress. Whilst that there is a demand for social housing in the immediate area, the site adjoins the zoned H2 housing lands in which permission was granted, outline permission and the reserved matters application has just come before committee. The first reserved matters application is for 740 dwellings on the first phase, which will provide 420 social housing units. Officers consider that if 2,500 dwelling units in total are delivered on H2, then 40% of the cumulative total would equate to approximately 1,000 social housing dwellings on H2. H2 is also in an area of housing need and it is in an accessible location on the West Bank in the immediate locality of Ballymagorty, which could adequately accommodate this proposal. Officers consider that given that there is provision within H2 to accommodate the social housing need in the immediate locality, the current land use zoning as existing recreation and open space should be protected as per its zoned use in the area plan. The loss of this open space is not justifiable when there is provision within the adjacent H2 site and also within other lands not protected for recreation and open space, which could accommodate a significant allocation of social housing from the waiting list and which would also exceed the required need specifically identified in Ballymagorty and Hazelbank area. The House and Monitor report undertaken by the LDP shows that there remains land for approximately 10,000 houses within the city development limits. On this basis, officers consider that the loss of the open space for social housing is not justifiable when provision has been made adjacent to the site within H2, which would exceed the specific need in the Ballymagorty and Hazelbank area, and also on other zoned land or land suitable for housing, which is identified in the current area plan. Land zoned as recreation and open space, therefore, should be protected. 
This application site is of public value given its strategic function as it acts as the green lungs and a buffer between the high density developments of Ballymagordy and the future planned significant major development on the adjacent H2 zoned lands immediately north of the site. The significance of this zoned open space in terms of being the green lungs and a buffer between the existing and future planned development of H2 is of the utmost importance and is of significant public value for this reason and therefore should be protected. So again, this is just the concept plan and it should be noted that further information was submitted since the application was presented at the predetermination hearing to address officers' earlier concerns regarding engineering works levels and the usability of the open space. So as well as the principle of the development, there are also other policy issues and an assessment under EMV7 of the area plan and H1 housing design and layout Officers are concerned that the development proposals will have an adverse impact on the vitality of existing vegetation, including mature trees within the application site and also on the site's boundaries. And the slide just shows an example of a proposed retaining wall, which would be located on the southern boundary of the site, is 90 metres in length, and there are mature trees along this boundary. So this retaining wall would have an adverse impact on the vitality of mature trees along the southern boundary. Officers are of the opinion that the full extent of the vegetation loss on the site would not actually be fully understood until detailed design stage. So just to summarise, this proposal is located on land zoned as existing recreation and open space and does not meet the exceptions test within the area plan policy R1 to permit development on land zoned for open space. The proposal is located on land zoned as existing recreation and open space and does not meet the exceptions test within PPS 8 policy OS1. Officers do not consider that there are community benefits to outweigh the loss of this protected recreation and open space zoning. The loss of zoned recreation and open space land should be resisted and the land protected, given its strategic importance and public amenity value acting as the green lungs and buffer between Ballymagorty and H2. Development of these zoned lands would set an undesirable precedent for this type of development on other zoned recreation and open space lands. The social housing need in Ballymagorty can be accommodated on alternative sites within the city and not on land protected as open space and could be accommodated on the H2 lands. The social housing provision allowed within H2 exceeds the need in the immediate Ballymagorty and Hazelbank area. The urban parkland outside the settlement limit does not meet the criteria of policy OS3 of PPS8 and does not meet the spirit of what this policy was intended for. To provide the housing and infrastructure will result in the loss of substantial mature trees and vegetation on the application site. Officer's recommendation is therefore to refuse the application and there are five refusal reasons listed within your report and on the slide above. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Members, um, we have a speaker uh, who's going to address you here on behalf of the applicant. So, can I welcome uh, the agent for the applicant, uh, Gemma Jobling? Gemma, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and uh, I suppose uh, I now take the opportunity to invite you to uh, address the committee. So go ahead, Gemma. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me OK. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Again, as we outlined during the PDH, Braidwater and Apex seek to provide sympathetic extension to the Ballymagorty neighbourhood to meet an urgent housing need. The proposed housing and roads are entirely located within the settlement limit and only the proposed parkland is outside the limit. The housing is intentionally located on the flattest part of the site to integrate with the existing housing and also to, to retain that green buffer along the stream. We believe this meets the legal and policy tests and is an approvable scheme. And there are three policy points that I would ask you to consider. Firstly, the Planning Act requires you to have regard to the area plan and to other material considerations, and these include the dairy area plan being out of date. Its function was to provide sufficient land to meet the community's needs over the plan period. Around 11,500 homes were supposed to be built, but the zoned land has not delivered, and combined with low build rates, this has resulted in high levels of housing stress and homelessness today. Therefore, the second material consideration is the need for housing in the city. This is the first investment in Ballymagorty in 40 years. This is a low value area of zoned open space with a history of antisocial behaviour. And so it's material, there's an opportunity to provide new housing, new park, new road infrastructure and a biodiversity gain through additional planting. 
Secondly, the SPPS provides the guiding principle and states that permission should be granted having regard to an up-to-date plan and other material considerations unless it will harm acknowledged interests. Again, the plan is out of date, there are no acknowledged interests and therefore the five material considerations must be given greater weight and these provide the basis for an approval. Thirdly, PPS 8 allows for the development of zoned open space where it will result in community benefit as has been outlined. In this case, we say it's fivefold. Firstly, it will provide social housing in a deprived ward. The West Bank is an area of housing need with a waiting list of 2,885, of which over 200 are in housing stress. This is within the top five wards of deprivation in the city, yet this community has not had any investment in its housing stock for 40 years. The recent approvals and land banks will not meet all of this need by 2025. H2 will provide around 2,500 to 3,000 homes by 2033, of which 40% are almost around between 800 and 1,000 will be social housing. And you've just granted the first 420. But as indicated earlier, this won't be delivered on day one. The site works and build rate will see around 200 social homes at most by 2025. So there's still a shortfall. And this isn't Ballymagorty, it's two miles away over a road. So likewise, the Heartland scheme that was approved last month for 250 units will also take a couple of years to complete. And even if we add all of these together with our site and the adjacent site, this still amounts to less than 900 houses. So that's still a shortfall of almost 2,000 shy of the 2,885 by 2025. And whilst there might still be capacity in the limits, this hasn't met the current need and there is no indication that H3, for example, will be delivered anytime soon. The only way to tackle this urgent housing need is through multiple housing sites with a willing applicant. Apex is committed to delivering social housing on for Ballymagorty. Second benefit is to tackle the nuisance and antisocial behaviour, like the fly tip and the fires, the scramble, scrambler use, and significantly, uh, 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 recently, sorry, a significant arms find in this site. The third benefit is to create a new public park in this part of the city where there is none. This will provide running routes for health and wellbeing, education walks for schools, a range of community facilities, and overall provide a much better quality of open space for this area. And it will improve the biodiversity through an extensive planting program. The fourth, fourth benefit is to upgrade the road infrastructure with the 300 metres of footpaths and new signalised crossing points and this will provide better pedestrian linkages through Ballymagorty. And finally, the fifth benefit is to sustain the Ballymagorty community and provide a place for future generations. There is now overwhelming community support for this scheme. We have completed three public engagement processes or uh, events and at the, following the last one uh, and following the change of access, the community have now voiced their support for the scheme and you, you'll have heard there was over 20 letters of support received. So in summary, members, we believe this scheme will provide a significant community benefit that will far outweigh this loss of this low value open space. Last month, this committee recognised the urgent housing need by approving housing on lands entirely outside the settlement limit. The housing on this land is inside the limit and there's a lower policy threshold. Based on the substantial community benefit this housing and park will provide, it meets the exceptions under policy OS1. And notably, it doesn't provide a, a clear list, it just says a substantial community benefit. This scheme can also still achieve the original objectives of the plan by providing a green buffer. So it's a win-win, members. It addresses the poor condition of the lands and it meets the housing need for this community. It will not cause demonstrable harm to interests of acknowledged importance. And these material factors justify approval and is in line both with the Planning Act and with the SPPS. Members, we believe this is an opportunity that embraces the three pillars of your community plan and will improve the wider social, economic and environmental needs of the community. The five material planning considerations meet the policy exceptions. Therefore, it's defensible and approvable scheme and it will not set a, a wide ranging precedent. And um, finally, members, I'd just say, well, what's the alternative? We leave the land in private ownership. It continues to fall into a deteriorated state. The local community continues to suffer from antisocial behaviour. There's still no investment in the Ballymagorty housing stock and the wait housing waiting list continues not to be met for this local area. Members, I'm happy to answer any questions and hopefully that uh, sets out our case. I'm also accompanied today by Carl Dorman, 
for roads and drainage and Andrew Bunbury for landscape. And we also have a member from Braidwater's team as well, Vincent Bradley, if you have any questions. Thank you for your time, members. Thank you, uh, Gemma, uh, for the presentation. Uh, and obviously do note that there are others um, along with you who might perhaps be able to answer other questions that you don't have all the answers. We all know not everybody has all the answers. Councillor uh, Patricia Lowe, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Gemma. Just one question, uh, Gemma, regarding the biodiversity, and can you just maybe clarify uh, the, the the plan for the biodiversity gain um, around the park and etc. The park etc. Go ahead, John. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Logue. Yeah, well, in preparing this, this application was subject to a full voluntary environmental impact assessment, and through that, we had engaged an uh, ecological assessment. Now, that determined that a number of the hedgerows were really of low and poor ecological value. So, through their expertise, we asked them to advise us on what sort of planning could be incorporated into the scheme. And within that, and within the wider park, there's a whole host of, of um, measures there. So to run through some of them, we propose to bolster any of the existing boundaries with new native hedging. Now that's over two and a half kilometres long around the site. And particularly, we're focusing along the water course there to really improve and uh, enhance that existing boundary along the edge of the stream. We're also including a birch glade, or where it's essentially will be a lot of new birch trees planted centrally within that area that sits to the, the west of the site and outside of the, the plan limit. We also have proposals for wildflower meadows with areas um, where there will be other elements of planting throughout the site internally within the lands that are within the settlement limit where we have the open space to service the new housing. We have a series of, of trees and new planting areas and overall our ecologist has advised and was set out in the ecological chapter of the environmental impact assessment that that will result in a biodiversity gain for the area and we're certainly seeking to offset and to compensate the removal of any of the um, low value existing field boundaries and in fact I believe that was understood and, and recognised by the Northern Ireland Environment a Agency which is indicated by their um, indication that there's no objections to the proposal. It's a requirement where you're removing any uh, woodlands or native tree and hedgerows to provide compensatory open space so by essence their, their acceptance and no objections to the scheme would, would endorse that. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Gemma. Th thanks, uh, Councillor Dobbins. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Gemma, uh, for that. Uh, I do have a question, but before I ask the question, I would like to make it a point you had said um, with regard to uh, this committee passing um, a similar um, application last month. Uh, I would like to remind you as an agent that um, each application is considered on its own merit um, and not to be said as a precedent or anything else. It is, it is um, judged on its own merit. So um, this one, like this one, will be judged uh, on its own merit. My question is, there was reference there from the officer that there was trees that were um, in danger with um, the retaining wall that, that would be required. Uh, so can I ask, what are you doing about those trees? Um, will they be retained? And can you guarantee that? Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, that really will be worked out through the detailed reserve matters design, but the retaining wall sits to the rear of the row of bungalows that we have on that central portion of the site. So the idea would be to step down from the higher land to the rear and then uh, step down into the proposed site area. So the retaining wall would be to the rear there. So there's no reason why we couldn't retain that hedge row along the rear of the site because there's plenty of space between that and where the row of the proposed bungalows would be. And the idea was really to nestle those bungalows into the, the slope and landform as it steps down so that you can watch over the rest of the site and the access road within it. Um, but that, that would all be detailed through the Reserve Matters application. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dobbins. Anyone else, any questions for the agent? 
or indeed those in her company. None in the chamber. Yeah. And go, go ahead, Councillor Gallagher. Oh, thank you, Chair Linton. Just Make sure you hear Councillor Gallagher, just if you could put it on the chat. I know I didn't see it initially, but it doesn't I know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm taking lessons from the last time you didn't see it. All right, go ahead, Councillor Gallagher. I, I just it's around I, uh, the public consultation. I, and, and, and there was a lot of public uh, no objections to this. And then there was a further uh, public consultation. And just regards, how did that go? Yeah, we, we had three public consultation events in total. So the first one wasn't particularly well attended and we'd really put up two different options for an access um, and the what access issues weren't really raised. But after we submitted the application and we had, had initially proposed the access running beside the community centre there, there was overwhelming. There was a lot of, of public concern about it. And that's that's why community consultation works because the feedback was really clear that that was not something that the community wanted so we went away and we looked at options and we listened and we amended the scheme in response to that and that's why the scheme presented to you now proposes the new access running through the adjacent site but before we submitted those amendments to the planning office we went back and held another consultation event in the local area last October, October 2021. So before we held that, we put a press notice in the local newspaper and we also leafleted, um, I think it was about 500 metres of the site. And we had a really good turnout at that time. And in fact, a lot of the people who were very opposed to it initially came back and said, we're, we're so much happier with that now. In fact, I think one of them asked whether they could put their name down for, for all of the houses. But then also, thirdly, uh, after the PDH, um, one of the councillors had suggested that it might be worthwhile just to get a better clarity around the community's uh, views of the site to hold another event or to re-engage and, and we listened to that as well and we held that consultation event uh, earlier this year uh, after the PDH I think it was around uh, end of February start of March time and again um, it was relatively well attended it was a it was a really old night so in the absence of, of people coming one of the, the guys from the team went around door to door as well to let people know about the proposal and that there wasn't any further changes but just to let them know um, that it's still in the system and again the support was was overwhelming at that stage i think initially and in hindsight understandably so and that's why community consultation is so important in the planning process i mean there really was concerns about where the access was going but as i say that that's the nature of the process we were able to listen to respond and to amend it and now that the feedback has been positive and so many people had said like they've maybe had children that have grown up and now have children but they're now having to live on the other side of the city or elsewhere and they would love to have an opportunity for them to move closer to home and as I say, a lot of people were asking you know, can you contact apex could they get their name on the list for a house here and there really was overwhelming support and one of the things that came through loud and clear was that there wasn't new houses for for people to move into you know when they grew up and move on in that area and they really didn't consider um the new houses around Skeg and Gallia to be part of the Ballymagorty community and they felt that they were moving away and they, they were they were pleased to see that there was now investment in this area and the other thing that came through loud and clear was really the the parkland and in fact that's one of the reasons why we included the nature walk within the parkland because that came through from some of the parents of children at the local school where they were saying there really isn't anywhere for the school to take the kids so they asked if we would include a nature trail that the school could then uh, benefit from and, and take them around and again that was informed by the consultation process so i i think the community consultation was re was a really important part of this process and you know apex are committed to building homes for the community and they want it to, to tie in and they want it to respond to the community's needs and um, we feel it has it has uh, developed to the for the benefit of the proposal the community consultation has really helped help to inform the proposal thanks Gemma. happy enough for that Councillor Gallagher. thank you okay thanks paul uh Councillor dobbins thank you chair for letting me in again Gemma. just um just on that you've said there um, during your consultations, I suspect then that Apex and um, were also in attendance at these consultations. You've made reference to um, people in the community, you know, wanting their their sons, daughters, you know, back and staying in the community and not going elsewhere. Can I ask 
what has Apex made uh, or whoever you know is going to be uh, in charge of these social housing has has anybody made reference to guarantees that that um, these houses will will be given priority to people in the area or from the area? I, I just need that clarified before my decision. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. No, that's not something that I think Apex can do. I think it really relies on the, the waiting list and those in housing stress uh, are moved on the wait, waiting list. Uh, it, it's outside of their control. But essentially, the idea is to provide homes to create an extension of Ballymagorty. And that's one of the reasons why the access you know, is coming through that area um, to, to, to read as an extension of that. But I think it would go against the housing executives uh, and the housing associations' rules really for um, allocating homes to to those on the waiting list. Thank you, Gemma. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, Councillor Dobbins. Anybody else? Any other questions for the agent here? Don't see anybody in the chat box? Okay. Uh, Gemma, I have just a couple of observations, little questions, I suppose. Um, um, I mean, I was one of those who attended the site visit, and, and I think it wouldn't be um, an exaggeration to say that the topography here is quite challenging, uh, and and you know the design uh, that's being introduced, albeit this is an outline application as well, probably does recognise the challenges inherent in the topography. However, putting all of that aside, um, and uh, no, that's that's for people to overcome if indeed uh, the application is, say, approved here today. But you did mention the H2 delivery time scale, uh, and I think it's a fair question to ask them, bearing in mind that it's a challenging topography uh, that you're dealing with, uh, that it's an outline application, when might we actually expect to see delivery of this particular uh, development? Uh, we have just seen, as you, as you already outlined yourself, uh, that a number of uh, the H2 homes have been approved here today. So, I mean, if we reference that, I think it's only fair that we ask that particular question as well. What might be the delivery time scale on something like this? Because um, we all recognise and we all do understand that there is actually, of course, uh, a housing crisis um, uh, here. Uh, and I think, you know, perhaps the last thing we do want to do be making promises on delivery for things that can't be delivered in the speed uh, that that um, that we might want. Yeah, well, one of the things that we looked at in the design was how we could work with the topography because you're you're right that would affect the deliver delivery time scale. So, for example, the access road follows an existing contour, and the housing is all intentionally located in the southern southwestern sort of portion of the site, which is the flattest area of the site, and that's to limit the amount of cut and fill. And really, there's there's very little by way of cut and fill required because we have worked with the. The contours, I mean, our, this this section of the site proposes somewhere between 60 and 70 units. So that could certainly be delivered within uh, less than a year from gaining reserve matters approval. I suppose the next question then is if we were to get outline approval and we went through reserve matters, depending on how long that would take, let's say four to six months, um, hopefully, because a lot of the, the work has been done, particularly because this was uh, accompanied by an environmental impact assessment. So really you're looking at was it 16 months plus uh, maximum another year? So, eight, or sorry, six months plus maximum another year for the build out. So you're certainly talking all of the homes being delivered within 18 months subject to that um, reserve matters processing time frame. Uh, hopefully that assists you. It's, it's, I suppose it's different from H2 in that, I mean, you, you appreciate the applicant on this application is Braidwater and Apex. So Braidwater have, give, that's where my information came from was through Braidwater and what they've advised us in terms of H2 is that a lot of the work that'll have to be done in the first sort of six months to a year or the, the site preparation works in terms of access roads and other engineering works within the site. Um, so that's what will take up a lot of their initial time. Don't, whereas we don't have the same level of, of that engineering works because it's a much, much smaller scheme. Okay. Um, thank you, Gemma. Um, that's really the only question and observation that I had in relation to it. As I said, um, 
I, I was on the site visit and, and I appreciate the, the site very well as a result of doing that. Um, okay, members, Gemma, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you sit back and relax for a minute. Uh, I'm gonna open it up now, members. If you have any uh, questions for the officer in relation to the application, Mr. Luke. It's not a question, but I just want to make a proposal. Uh, should I wait until anybody, any questions? Well, I was going to say, just give it a breather a second, Patricia, and then if you have a proposal, I'll take it, of course. Yeah. Um, I see no questions for the officers, so, um, Angela, you do have a question. One question. Bear with me, Patricia. Patricia, just bear with me, because I'll, I'll actually second your proposal. But, um, can I ask the officer, please? Um, you described this piece of green area as being a buffer or the green lungs <clears throat> that is separating to Ballymagorje and whatever the next one was, H2, yeah, as separating that. Surely, surely we should not be be doing this, surely we should be having a flow. Unless that recreational ground is de you know, developed for football pitches or something to that effect, right? Surely we, would, we should not be separating two developments. Because in my eyes, and in my opinion, you're making a them and us sort of scenario, right? I, I for one, with with the PPS8, and I've read this over so many times, that community support par paragraph that you have, I, I definitely think that the need does outweigh um, the interpretation of, of that PPS8, that it, it has demonstrated that there is community support and it has stem, there is demonstration here that there is a, a community benefit with these houses um, being allowed to go ahead, and it's it's just it's just my question. I can't for the life of me understand how you reckon that this is a, a buffer or the green lungs between two areas. Surely that's what we should be avoiding, you know. Um, what was on any development, or is that just your your interpretation of that PPSA that you're not seeing the outweighing of the benefits? Uh, through the chair, um, the suppose the, the strategic open space and the green lungs is actually defined in the Annex A of PPS eight. It does have its um, own definition, um, being of public value, and that is officers' view that those so both parcels of land which have been zoned for open space, they're protected for a reason, and the area plan of PPS8 also seeks to protect them. So we consider that as strategic open space between the high density development of Ballymer Gorgi and Hitch2. This application doesn't actually, you know, you're, you've mentioned there about the applications not. Uh, I suppose the green wage or the green open space shouldn't be, you know, the development should be brought together. The two applications aren't really that interlinked, even if development were to take place on the site. So we do consider that, you know, the strategic open space has the green lungs, which is defined in Annex A of PPS 8, is of the utmost importance in terms of what the definition is in terms of public community value. Sorry, Chair, and thank you. Um, my question is, do you see what you said there, and you said the word value, right? The value of that green, that area, and for want of a better word, it's wasteland. So that value, what I think what I'm asking is, can you sort of define that to me? What What is the value of that green piece of, of wasteland that is causing so much heartache and trouble to this, to the people of Ballon or to themselves. Thank you, through the chair. Um, I suppose 
With the definitions of, of what is considered to be open space, um, we see the value of this as green fields, vegetation, biodiversity. It doesn't necessarily have to have a use for recreation. Um, at the minute it is closed, it's in private ownership, but it provides that, um, I suppose, outlook as well. And that separation, I suppose, it's just a difference of opinion as to maybe what you consider and what officers consider. Um, but it's a, the biodiversity and that just green space that um, is also a value to people that live in an urban area, that they can have green space in their locality, that it's not all built up with houses. So I suppose that's the, the value that officers have seen of it. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Maura uh, has just said that you'd like to come and explain a few other uh, yeah. parts of the rationale behind this. I just think it's important, members, to remember that this long or any open space that was protected in the area plan was protected for a reason. It went through a process and the scale of the open space, where it was located, was all very carefully considered. And, um, and I suppose it's important to remember that the weight of that consideration is still you know, important as time goes on and that the dairy area plan is the current extant plan and that we will go through the rationalisation and reviewing of that in the future. But currently we are where we are with this plan and also the, you know, protecting open space, the PPS8 is there because at any point those lands still could be used for other types of recreational use if and when they come about, where if we've lost that space, and it's not just this space, there's a number of open spaces in and around the vicinity. And as I said, the scale, proportion, distribution of that in the city and the district was all an important consideration. This is not a small piece of land. This is a, a very large, long, and the whole point of this was obviously to protect that, whereby we zoned a massive area of land beside it for housing. It's literally, um, you know, touching the zoning, it's not far away, it's within the Ballamagorty district. So I think members need to be very aware of that, the material of what has been said today. This is in the area of, um, in terms of the need and the satisfi satisfaction of that need, um, being right beside the site in question. So it's important when we're looking at the exceptional test and why you would outweigh that, that you consider what what the, the current status and, and, and where we are. And bearing in mind, importantly, that H2 has just been approved in the scale of social housing and the potential for housing on that site um, has to be recognised. And I think it's really important that members think that through. Thanks. Okay, hey, Maura. Okay, um, any other questions for officers? Okay, um, Councillor Lowe, you did indicate you want to make a proposal. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, look, I have uh, looked very carefully at this application and I've also listened very carefully to the officers um, and the, the agents. And um, I would like to propose that we uh, do not accept the officer's recommendation and that we, uh, uh, we, um, propose uh, approve this, uh, this application. I do believe that um, PPS8 and especially zero, Z O S one of that, um, that it does, this application does meet the criteria set out in, in that aspect of PPS8. It, does indeed, um, as I broke down, it substantially outweighs the loss of any open space as there's no uh, significant detrimental impact. And, you know, I suppose we have looked at that open space and we have looked at the, the need. There is, instead of substantial um, detrimental impact, 
on the community and the people of Glove Round there, I believe that there is a substantial benefit, a uh, positive benefit uh, to uh, the community and those especially who are on the housing waiting list uh, for that area. Also, it will improve, um, I believe, the, the biodiversity and the use of that open space that will bring uh, a derelict open space that has been known for its antisocial behaviour uh, and all of that. And I do think that the developers, um, Great Water, along with Apex, have presented here a very uh, welcome scheme with a usable uh, open park and much needed uh, social housing. And I have no doubt that it will be social housing uh, that will be uh, supplied in that site. So therefore, uh, I'm again reiterating that um, I'm proposing that we do not accept the officer's recommendation, um, as I believe that uh, the the test and PP uh, S8 have been met and we go for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Log. Uh, thanks for the um, proposal. Uh, Councillor Davins. Yeah, um, I do one hundred percent appreciate uh, what you have just said, Maura. But I reading upon uh, this over and over again and from what I've heard today I would like to second uh, Councillor Logue's uh, proposal I I don't see I don't see the benefit of a green field which is problematic um, sitting in between uh, one already established area and and a new area I think it's going to cause a lot more problems further on down the line and so therefore where's the benefit in that I, I just don't see that benefit whilst i for one live in an area where you can open your window and look in the green fields i love that i enjoy that but as i say without without um the community putting their shoulder behind us and yes it is very evident that they have um, there has been consultation after consultation, so therefore um, the community have been in agreement where they weren't at the start, and they have been in agreement now because of uh, different shift patterns on you know, accesses and things like that. So if the community are behind it, why, are we go no, why should we be going against it? I do understand, Maura, with regard to the green, the green area, but if that causes more problems than enough, and with further expansion of H2, it may cause even more. So therefore, why not have a nice flow of houses, you know, going through? Um, so therefore, I'm in agreement with um, Councillor Logue. I do not see, I think that the need outweighs the PPSA, uh, outweighs um, the PPSA there and uh, with community support behind it, it would definitely be a community benefit. And just under three acres, yeah, it, it might be large, but it's not very large. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Councillor Dobbins. We, obviously, we've got the proposal and we have a, a seconder. But before, um, before we go to the vote here, members, um, I just want to reflect on a couple of things uh, in, in relation to that, and that is that planning policies, as I see them, uh, in relation to um, a situation like this, exist because they exist to future-proof um, uh, open space. So then you're beginning to balance, you know, short-term gain against long-term gain. Uh, and bearing in mind, you know, some of the examples of long-term gain that we can see in our city and district. So I find myself imagining if we'd gone for short-term gain over long-term gain, then we may well not perhaps have Marianas Glen. We may well not have Kilfinan Country Park. We might not have the Craig and Byrne Park. We might not have the Ballyarnett Country Park. If people had gone for short-term gain 15 odd years ago. Uh, and I think that's what officers are saying here is they're basically saying, 
you know, if you make this decision now, you'll gain now. But in years to come, the people who live in this area will have nowhere, really, that they can call a green space, apart from, obviously, this very small park development. Um, and so, for me, that's part of the balance here. That's, that's a very important part of the balance. But, look, I've got a vote, and everybody else in the committee has a vote, too. Um, we do have a proposal on the floor. Uh, I'm going to put that proposal to the floor. Um, and uh, Maura, you're content you have enough to work on here? I just want to clarify something. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, there's just another point of clarification in terms of um, community benefit and the community, you know, in terms of planning, in terms of the planning application, we have objections to this application and we have a number of letters of support. There may have been community consultation, but in terms of the evidence, and, and it wouldn't be overwhelming that anyone, you know, what we have in terms of evidence in the file to say that it's fully 100% supported by the community. In fact, it's it's not very clear. So therefore, you know, we have taken that on into account. We take, uh, in planning applications, we take on board, particularly around this, um, you know, a PPS-8. So it's just to clarify that in terms of the facts that that's why, you know, we would have weighed that up as well, just, just for clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. Um, no, I'm not taking any more comment. As I said, I'm calling the vote um, uh, at this point. Um, people had the opportunity to speak, uh, and I said after I had spoken that I would be calling the vote, so that's the way we're going to play this. Um, uh, so, members, Maura, I'm going to pass it to you if you'd like to ask people what their opinion on this is. Obviously, the recommend or the proposal here from Councillor Logue, second to be Councillor Dobbins, is to overturn the officer recommendation. Thank you, Chair. So this is item... Five. Um, just to make sure, I'm, you know, it's item four. Apologies, <laughs> I'm ahead of myself. Item four, um, members, this is a vote um, to not accept the officer's recommendation. Um, Alderman Alan Breslin. Aye. Alderman Keith Carrigan. Alderman Keith Carrigan. I'll come back. Um, apologies for Graham Mark. Uh, Councillor Jason Barr. Barr, Mark. Councillor Raymond Barr. Abstain, Mark. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Yes. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Four. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Four, but I want to register my um, my concern of not being allowed to make a comment in, in respect to this application. Councillor Dan Kelly. Four. Councillor Patricia Logue. Or. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Councillor Philip McKinney. Uh, Councillor Sean Mooney. Or. It's nine, four, one against, and two abstentions, Chair. Thank you. Okay, and um, thank you, Gemma, for uh, coming along and speaking to the committee today. Um, for the record, I did indicate, Councillor Jackson, I did ask if anybody else wanted to speak. Nobody indicated I moved on from that point. Um, so just for clarity, uh, and I do note your concerns as you uh, reference it. But I had indicated that I would be moved on after, uh, after I had no other indicated speakers. So, um, Maura, do you want to come back in again? Yeah. Sorry, I just have to notify um, the committee that given the fact that this is a major application and a major application which would significantly prejudice the implementation of the local plan, plans, objectives and policies, um, we will have to notify the 
DFA on this particular application. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Maura. Okay. Um, just before we move on, members, um, Councillor Kelly um, uh, uh, was in contact through the, through the course of the meeting um, with myself and Eamon, um, uh, and Eamon responded on my behalf. Councillor Kelly had, uh, in relation to um, application number one, J20142295F, uh, he had wanted to um, put, uh, with your permission, uh, add another condition uh, to uh, that uh, application. I'm, I'm content to hear uh, Councillor Kelly uh, on this occasion. So, uh, Councillor Kelly, if you'd, li if you'd like to um, take it from here. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and apologies to you and to the committee. Uh, it was an oversight on my part not to raise it at the time I had it listed. Um, the nature of the, uh, the additional condition that I was uh, I meant to ask the officer about was whether it was appropriate to propose uh, a condition in relation to what happens the the office buildings um, and that sort of ancillary um, structures uh, around it uh, when the site is remediated. Um, and this is kind of going into the, long into the future, but I just thought uh, it would be better to um, have a condition in relation to those uh, structures. Um, so that was basically my question. And if, if uh, such uh, a condition is appropriate, then I would be proposing it uh, if that's accepted by the committee. Um, yes, thank you, Councillor Kelly, through the chair. Um, officers are content that we can um, apply a condition to the grant of approval, um, which will require all structures to remove to be removed off site um, and the ground restored um, whenever the unfilling has ceased on the site. Okay, all content to move forward on that basis. Councillor Kelly, you're all right with that. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate that. Not, not at all. No problem. Um, okay. Uh, next application. Application number five in the agenda. LA 11 2020 0318 uh, Um And again, you're a busy woman today. Sarah, back to you again. Item 5 is LA 11 2020 This is a social housing development and associated infrastructure, landscaping and ancillary works, including improvements to Elac Road, Branch Road, Roundabout, and new pedestrian crossing on Elac Road. The site is located on lands between Whitehouse Road and O'Nolan Crescent, Bally McGorty, and officer's recommendation is to refuse. A predetermination hearing was held on the 9th of February 22, and at the PDH, members agreed to a site visit. The site visit took place on the 21st of February 2022 and the details are in members' reports. So this site is over three hectares and comprises of two agricultural fields. A mature tree and vegetated boundary traverses the site, which will have to be removed in its entirety to accommodate the development. This site is zoned for recreation and open space in the area plan and access up to the site is from Hewitt Road. This site is steeply sloping in topography and slopes towards the north and northeastern boundary. The northern boundary is defined by a mature tree belt and a water course and the eastern boundary by a woodland. Existing dwellings are located at Swift Court to the south of the site and by McGorty Community Centre and Council's Play Facility and Pitches are to the southwest. The red line was amended during the processing of the application and extended to include the lands required for off-site mitigation works to Elick Road, Branch Road, Roundabout, and that amended red line location plan is within members' reports. So this is the extract map from the dairy area plan showing the application site located on land zone for recreation and open space. It's located immediately south of Hatch 2. So this is a photograph of the application site, which is steeply sloping towards the tree and river boundary on the north. Another photograph showing the tree gripping on the northern boundary and the woodland area to the east of the site. This is a photograph of the application site and you can see the H2 fields beyond the mature trees in the photograph. Photograph of the northern and eastern boundary of the site with the woodland to the north and east of the site. Existing mature tree and hedgerow vegetation is located to the west of the site and a field boundary will have to be removed in its entirety to accommodate the proposed development. 
This is a photograph of the access into the site. And again, the access road leading to the site which serves the housing is from Hewitt Road. So in terms of a consultee summary, the housing executive support for the proposal is based on the wider West Bank housing needs assessment area. The housing need projection for West Bank is 2885 units between 21 and 26 and the specific need within Ballarmagorty, Hazel Bank area as of the 31st of March 22 was 272 applicants as their first choice with 208 of these in housing stress. Historic Environment Division had no objections. Environmental Health considered that a noise assessment would be required should the application be approved as sources of noise from nearby businesses could impact on future residences. Locks Agency, Rivers, Water Management Unit, Inland Fisheries, Regulation Unit, Natural Environment Division and SES have no objections subject to conditions. Following the predetermination here in the agent submitted correspondence to address issues of stormwater discharge and foul discharge, NA Water were reconsulted and now have no objection subject to conditions. DFI Roads have no objection to the access from Hewitt Road and Ringford Road and the internal layout should the application be progressed to reserve matters will be required to be designed to create in place places which will necessitate changes to the indicative layout which is before members in the concept plan. Council's Green Infrastructure team confirmed that they will not take responsibility for becoming landscape manager. They've raised issues that the outdoor gym area is poorly sited behind dwellings. They raised concerns about the infilling of the large section of the open space to the north part of the site towards the river will create issues for maintenance and gradients of the path and raised concerns about how much of the open space is actually usable recreational open space. In terms of letters of support, <clears throat> 15 letters of support 14 of which were received in March 22, following the PDH were submitted on the application and identified the need for social housing, considered the area of waste ground where there's antisocial behaviour, it will be put to good use. They support the extension of the neighbourhood, facilities for the whole community, knock on benefits for businesses, a safer, healthier environment, support the walking trails and open space and play park, better supervision of the area and welcome changes to the access road. Two letters of objection were received in this application and raised issues on the impacts on existing residential properties, environmental impacts, traffic impact, increased traffic and congestion. The proposed road access is small road and not adequate for the size of development, a negative impact on the existing settled community, antisocial behaviour, safety for children and impacts on drainage and sewage. So this is the concept proposal which indicates this proposal would be for approximately 94 dwellings with landscape and an access road and ancillary works. The concept was recently revised due to the access road being utilised by the adjacent applicant to provide an access road for the adjacent site. So this was the concept master plan received in October 21 showing the link road through the adjacent application site. To provide the through road to the adjacent site, it requires that the apartment buildings would be reorientated from the original concept submitted, which would reduce the amount of communal space for the apartments. The agent did not amend the original concept plan submitted and is of the opinion that the proposed layout plan at reserve matters could be based on this new indicative landscape master plan layout. So in terms of the policy assessment for this application site, the application has been assessed in accordance with the dairy plan policy R1. The principle of development, development on the site is not acceptable as this proposal will result in the loss of land zoned for recreation and open space. The major housing proposal does not meet the exceptions test in the area plan to allow for development on land zoned for open space. For example, this major development is not related to the existing use. The existing use of the site is zoned recreation and open space lands regardless of its current condition. The proposal is not for leisure facilities and there are no buildings to replace. Officers are also concerned that the majority of the site has been identified for, for provision of a residential development with very little usable amenity recreational space in compensation for the loss of open space in this locality. The proposal is therefore contrary to policy or one of the area plan. In terms of the SPPS and PPS8, there is a presumption against the loss of open space irrespective of its physical condition and appearance. An exception will be permitted where it is demonstrated that redevelopment would bring substantial community benefit. The agent for this application considers this substantial community benefit is the social housing need and economic benefit, the lack of other suitable zoned housing land in the West Bank and public access to new areas of open space and amenity areas. 
So in terms of the social housing need, this zoned recreation open space land is located on the western edge of the city and has a substantial zoning of open space between the existing housing at Ballymagordy and Hitch 2. Hitch 2 immediately adjoins the application site. The social housing need is 2885 units between 2021 and 26, and the specific need in Bally Magordi Hazelbank is 272 applicants with first choice, 208 of which are in housing stress. In terms of the economic benefits and lack of suitable zoned housing land, the agent has stated the proposal would bring economic benefits. However, no evidence was submitted from the agent for officers to consider this further. No evidence has been submitted from the agent to demonstrate that there are other other alternative sites were not suitable for social housing. Officers consider there is sufficient land available within the development limits and on land not protected as zoned recreation and open space lands. And the housing monitor report undertaken by Council's LDP team shows that there remains land for approximately 10,000 houses within the city development limits. And considering improved public access and improved value amenity, the agent considers that the site does not currently have public access and its function as the field has limited amenity value to the local community. The agent considers that the proposal will provide public access to new areas of amenity and the river corridor. However, officers disagree with this statement as the proposed open space is not usable within the application site. Access to the river beyond the site is not part of this application and cannot be delivered by the applicant under this proposal. So in summary of the exceptional circumstances and substantial community benefit, officers are of the opinion that the loss of the zoned recreation and open space should be resisted and the land protected as per its zoning in the area plan. Officers do not consider there are substantial community benefits to outweigh the loss of this zoned open space. The social housing need identified by the housing executive is acknowledged. However, officers do not consider the provision for social housing on its own would bring substantial community benefit to allow for this major development to be considered an exception to the SPPS and PPS8. And therefore, the proposal is contrary to the SPPS and PPS8. Just in terms of the concept plan and the indicative landscape plan, in terms of PPS8 policy OS2, Officers do have concerns that the open space provision within the development site is not usable open space and therefore the percentage 20% which is required by policy has not been achieved. It is also evident from the sections and the concepts provided that a significant manipulation of levels, cutting and filling is required to accommodate housing on this application site. The open space therefore to the north of the site is on the periphery. And from assessment of the section, it would not be usable or meaningful, nor provide any recreational value, as approximately eight metres of infill is required for the proposed dwellings, which will effectively divorce the open space from the proposed housing. The open space, therefore, along the river at the northern boundary will be steeply sloped embankment with housing located above this and the pedestrian path below the housing. So this also raises safety and supervision concerns. This provides no recreational or social value to the site. And Council's green infrastructure team also raised concerns about the usability of the open space, the gradients and how the levels would tie into and connect to the western part of the site. Two other pockets of open space are proposed, but these are located along the road through the development and again do not provide meaningful or safe opportunities for play or recreational use. West officers appreciate that this is an outline application. A concept plan should demonstrate a satisfactory layout for the site. And just to show you the section through the site, this is section AA, which was submitted in March 22. This section is taken through the area of open space to the northern boundary, and the red dashed line shows the existing site levels. So you will note that there's approximately eight metres of unfilling required, and the open space, therefore, will be this steeped embankment, which I'm showing on the slide. And therefore, this open space proposed is not usable or meaningful. This is another section taken at the southern boundary. And at the southern boundary, there will, there will be an excess of four metres of cut in the landform required. There are mature trees located on this boundary, which would be unlikely to survive. And then the site would be open and exposed. Additionally, there's also the tree vegetation and boundary, which traverses the site, which has to be completely removed to accommodate the proposal. So this is a section which shows the level of cut required through to the adjacent site is approximately six metres at the boundary of the neighbouring land west of the site, and which is also subject to planning application LA 11 2020 Now, no updated section was submitted to demonstrate how the proposed through road 
would tie into the adjacent site robot engineering works would be required as part of this application. So in terms of PPS7 layout consider considerations, there has been no consideration as to how the development would integrate or be comprehensively developed with the adjacent application, with the exception of the through road to the adjacent site. The layout submitted would require significant manipulation of levels, extensive cut and fill required to facilitate development of the site. There's limited supervision of proposed houses onto open space areas to the north of the site. The extent of the parking and hardscape as shown in the concept would not add a quality to the development. It would be visually intrusive and the lack of uncurtilage parking and parking to the fronts of dwellings alludes to the site being overdeveloped. The extent of cut and fall to develop the site is extensive and does not respect the site's context or natural features. The level of infilling, particularly on the northern boundary, could impact on mature trees and vegetation and potentially impact on um, trees and vegetation also on the southern and eastern boundaries. This proposal does not respect the site in terms of its topography, layout and potential impacts on existing landscape and site features or levels. There is inadequate, usable or meaningful open space, which in turn does not promote personal safety. And the pedestrian connections and open space in the northern part of the site is severed from the housing. The two other pockets of open space are located on the main access road through the site, which would not provide a safe space for play. Therefore, this proposal also fails to comply with policy QD1 of PPS7 criteria A, B, C and D. So to summarise, this proposed development of approximately 94 social dwellings on the site does not meet the exceptions test to permit development on zoned recreation and open space as can be permitted in the area plan 2011. The proposal does not meet any of the exceptions within the SPPS and PPS8 to consider this major development an exception to policy that would bring substantial community benefit. The proposal would set an undesirable precedent for this type of development on other zoned recreation and open space lands which should be retained. Officers do not consider that there are substantial community benefit to outweigh the loss of this space which should be protected and retained as recreation and open space. And the concept proposals have not demonstrated that a satisfactory layout or open space proposals could be achieved in accordance with PPS 7 and PPS 8. Officers recommendation is to refuse and there are four reasons for refusal set out in members report. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, sir. Members, uh, just before we move on, um, bearing in mind that the Guildhall clock has just struck six o'clock, uh, my intention will be to stick with the protocol. Um, uh, the protocol obviously being that we would finish at six o'clock. I clearly now uh, can't stop at six o'clock because we have to hear this one out. Uh, but when we've uh, heard this one out, then uh, that'll be uh, the conclusion of uh, today's meeting and we will all be back in the same place again tomorrow. So just advise uh, that this is the last application we'll be hearing today. Um, so thanks for that, Sarah. Um, members, again, I have uh, Chris Bryson, agent on behalf of the applicant, uh, and Mark Gilmore uh, from the EHA group, the applicant, uh, online. So uh, I'll pass over to yourselves, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and apologies to members in advance, but you'll be hearing a lot of similar discussions that, that we've just had on, on the previous application. But if you'd indulge me, uh, I, I'd like to set out some uh, some pertinent points. Uh, I'll be using my speaking time to demonstrate that none of the four draft reasons for refusal can be sustained and that policy does indeed allow members to make a positive decision and grant permission for this outline application. Uh, as you've heard, I have Mark Gill more with me from EHA who are locally based building and development company with a strong track record of delivering both private and social housing in the city. All four draft reasons for refusal are based on the zoning of the application site as per their area plan. Therefore, the main issue is obviously the acceptability of the principle of development uh, and the weight to be afforded to what is an outdated area plan. 
Of course, the site is zoned for recreation and open space in the dairy area plan and relevant policy guards against uh, development in, in those designations. However, as you've already heard, members uh, are uh, will be aware of the Planning Act that allows you to make decisions in accordance with the local development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Therefore, you're perfectly within your rights to consider other relevant planning issues and weigh those against an out-of-date area plan. And if those other planning issues are considered to be of greater importance than the area plan, then you are free to approve this scheme. As you've already heard, the dairy area plan is over 21 uh, years old, uh, adopted in May 2000, expiry date of 2011, over, over a decade ago. Uh, and therefore, a lot of the policies and designations therein are no longer relevant to the city of today. And we would ask you to bear that in mind when considering this proposal. The first draft reason for refusal cites the potential for an undesirable precedent to be set should this application be approved. Uh, we say that this site is distinguishable from other zoned open space land in the area. As you've heard, it has no public access. It has no real public value. It lies directly into and connects to the Barnum McGrory community, and there are exceptional circumstances that would justify its development. Therefore, we feel the first reason for refusal does not stand up to scrutiny, and indeed, as we've already heard, each application must be considered on its own merits. Therefore, any future planning application to develop on other zoned open space sites must also demonstrate compliance with policy. Refusal reasons two and three cite the lack of community benefit that would outweigh the loss of open space. And again, we would point to the critical level of social housing need in the area. Uh, you know, over 2,885 dwellings required uh, up to 2024. Uh, and really, unless the council take bold and justified measures to allow housing development, that will go some way to addressing and meeting this high and growing level of social housing need, then that need will continue to spiral out of control and opportunities to meet it will diminish. Members will be totally justified, as they are, have already done, to cite the critical level of social housing need as a substantial community benefit that outweighs the loss of open space that has no public value. There is also, we would say, large and widespread community support for the scheme. Indeed, one of the letters of support has come from a local rep elected representative who, although no longer an elected representative, surely represented the views of his constituents when supporting the scheme. On the question of public value of the zoned open space, officers have already highlighted that they feel the land serve a purpose as a green wedge or green lungs for the area. And this may have been the case 20 plus years ago when the lands were originally zoned, but it is certainly not the case today. The lands have no public access, no amenity purpose, and therefore there is no need to divide these lands from the existing Ballymagrody community, or indeed divide the Ballymagrody community from the new H2 community, uh, should these lands remain undeveloped. Final draft reason for refusal talks about the proposed layout and the insufficient open space for the site. Uh, the submitted concept plan is just that. It's a concept of how the site could be developed. It demonstrates that there is scope to provide the housing as well as levels of private amenity space and public open space. And officers have referred to the usability of that open space. This scheme includes a proposed riverside walkway and nature trail that connects into the scheme that has just been approved. And uh, as well as that, officers have already said tonight that open space can perform a range of functions and doesn't necessarily only have to be usable. For example, its use as visual amenity or as green corridors, both of which will function well as part of this concept layout. And all these details can be developed further at reserve matter stage uh, when detailed designs will be progressed. Finally, and just in relation to the issue of level changes and, and level of cut and fill on site, um, th th that will be required and members will be well aware that many sites across the city and in the West Bank in particular have challenging topographies and there are always ways to design uh, around that and ensure that levels work with minimal intervention and minimal engineering works. And again, those details will be worked up at reserve matters stage. Considering this uh, and, and the debate just before this application, we would respectively request that members overturn the recommendation to refuse the application and grant outline planning permission. Uh, thank you, Chair. Happy to accept questions from members, should they have any. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, well, 
as you've indicated, you're happy to take questions. So, uh, members, open to you. Um, uh, if anybody would like to address Chris, anybody online? Okay, well, there you are, Chris. There's the good news. I think uh, most of the questions have probably been answered in the previous application. Um, okay. Members, again, uh, Chris, I, I, I don't see anybody indicating to speak or ask a question, so I'm going to move on if that's okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, okay. Um, members, uh, uh, questions to the officer. Questions to the officer either. Okay, members. Uh, there's a proposal in front of you. Um, cover, of course, the proposal. That's to refuse. So, over to you. Tricia. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, the officer. Um, look, I just want to again propose that um, we overturn the officer's uh, recommendation uh, to refuse and that we approve outline uh, planning permission uh, as um, I feel it meets the test of PPS 8. And also, look, I, I do recognise within the report that there are many challenges that need to be overcome, but we can um, uh, hopefully overcome them at the planning, uh, at the, the application stage if it comes, um, and that maybe the, the developers will uh, look at the issues within the report, and especially uh, regarding the green infrastructure as I think that would be most important within any uh, development. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Obviously, that's going to require a second. Uh, Councillor Dobbins. Yeah, and like before, um, we'll second Councillor Loeb's uh, proposal. Um, Why do you understand this is outline plan and permission? Um, um, I do have uh, a few safety um things um that need to be they need to have a look at it when they come back to us if they come back to us with uh for full planning permission um the green space um yeah it does highlight a number of issues um but i'm sure it can be addressed but happy to second patricia's proposal thank you thank you Councillor dobbins um, is there anybody else who wants to make any comment before we move to the vote on that? Okay. Uh, just before we do, uh, yeah, I, I would share those particular safety concerns around it. In actual fact, when I looked at the two applications, um, I mean, I know they're unrelated in some senses, but of course they are related in other senses as well. I actually found this one much more acceptable than I did the previous one, but that's by the by. We, we take them all as uh, uh, on their own individual merits. But again, yes, there, there are opportunities in, in relation to reserve matters moving forward. Members, um, I'm going to ask Maura to record the vote now. Um, so we'll do that. Okay, Maura, go ahead. Members, this is item five, and members are voting not to accept officer's recommendation to refuse the application, but are voting to approve and overturn the, the application recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin? For. Alderman Keith Kerrigan? For, Mara. Councillor Jason Barr? Gone, I'm told. Councillor Raymond Barr. Maura, just to clarify, it's been recommended I don't take part in any voting at today's meeting in lieu of receiving planning training uh, in the coming weeks, so therefore I'll abstain just to clarify that. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. It's an abstention. Councillor John Boyle. Go for it. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Councillor Paul Gallagher. For. Councillor Christopher Jackson. 
Four. Councillor Dan Kelly. Four. Councillor Patricia Logue. Four. Councillor Keir McGuire. Councillor Philip McKinney. It's gone. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Four. Unanimous. All right, members, that's unanimous. Um, uh, do you want to just clarify that again? Just clarify again. This is a major application, and like the previous, um, given the nature of the application, um, to notify DFI in regards to the, the the development plan. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you all online as well for um, joining us today. Uh, the meeting will resume tomorrow, Thursday at 2 p.m. where we will hear the rest of the applications uh, and one matter for decision and other matters for, open for information. Okay, members, we'll see you all same time tomorrow, same place. Thank you.